Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. And um, depending on where you're joining, up, joining us from, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to today's session of the IPRP Biosimilar Working Group Scientific Workshop on Increasing the Efficiency of Biosimilar Development Programs and Reevaluating the Need for Comparative Efficacy Studies. Um, I just want to thank everyone for spending the next few hours with us, and I want to give a special thanks to all of the IPRP Biosimilar Working Group members for contributing their valuable time and expertise in planning this workshop. Um, my name is Brooke Del Santo, and I am a public health analyst for the U.S. FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research's International Office, and I will be giving a few introductory remarks before we begin the presentations. So next slide. So please note that as an attendee, you will not be able to use your microphone or speak during the webinar. Um, throughout the presentation, feel free to use the Q&A function to input any questions you would like addressed by a panelist. Um, we just ask that <clears throat> you indicate whether your question is a general question or directed to a specific speaker so that we can have the right person answer. And finally, please note that today's session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the IPRP webpage in the coming weeks, along with presentation materials and speaker biographies. So thank you. So our um, agenda, overview looks like this. Firstly, I'm just going to give a quick little introduction, followed by um, presentations by international biosimilar development experts representing the pharmaceutical industry. And after a, a five-minute break, we're going to have a Q&A panel that will be moder moderated by Dr. Stefan Thurstrup from the European Medicines Agency. And then we'll wrap everything up with closing remarks from Dr. Sarah Yim from the US FDA. All right, next slide. So um, as I kind of indicated, this workshop is a culmination of discussions and planning from the members of the IPRP Biosimilar Working Group. And just as some quick background, this working group was established to discuss emerging regulatory issues related to biosimilar products. And it includes regulatory members from across the world, as you can see on this slide. Um, and I invite everyone to go to the IPRP website to learn more about the working group. Next slide. And as mentioned yesterday, the focus of this multi-day workshop is to discuss the need for comparative efficacy studies in biosimilar development programs. And yesterday we heard from um, wonderful regulatory experts on their experience and perspectives with clinical efficacy studies in biosimilar development programs. And today we have the privilege of building upon yesterday's discussion by highlighting industry experts' perspectives on these studies in biosimilar development programs. Next, next slide. And so moderating our session today is Dr. Stefan Thurstrup. He is a medical doctor and board certified specialist in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. He holds a PhD in pharmacology and has an extensive background in clinical internal medicine with special emphasis on adult respiratory medicine. He has substantial regulatory experience in the public and in public and private organizations. For example, he has worked for the Danish Medicines Agency in various capacities, including as a member of the EMA's Committee for Medical Medicinal Products for Human Use and the Committee for Advanced Ther Therapies. He was the head of the Danish Institute for Ra Rational Pharmacotherapy, the head of the Division of Medicines and Assessment and Clinical Trials, and co-chair of the European Commission's Working Group on Market Access for Biosimilars. He has also worked for a pharmaceutical consultancy company, NDA Group AB, and as an adjunct professor of pharmaco pharmacotherapy for the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Copenhagen. Um, and lastly, he has authored more than 30 scientific papers, guidelines, and textbook chapters. 
And currently, Dr. Thurstrup serves as the Chief Medical Officer at the European Medicines Agency. And Dr. Thurstrup, I'm going to turn it over to you to begin our presentations. Thank you very much, Brooke, and, and welcome to all the participants. I can see we have nearly 400 people listening in here, which is really, really great. Uh, the second, uh, second day for stakeholder engagement. So welcome all of you and, and thanks for, please adhere to the, uh, to the practicalities that, that Brooke alluded to in terms of questions and so forth. Without further ado, I, I think we should uh, go to the next slide and uh, turn to our presentation from industry perspective. The first presenter is Martin Schistel from Zanders. And uh, I think for many of us who have been in the area of, of biosimilars for many years, we know Martin from many different conferences. You can see he has a strong background in uh, bioanalysis uh, and he's been working for send us in, in a number of years in their global regulatory affairs uh, department for biopharmaceuticals. So thanks for being here today, Martin, and over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot. And it's my pleasure to start off with the industry presentation. So if we go to the next slide. So in short, I try to show you that from the science perspective, we have the opportunity to develop biosimilars without comparative efficacy studies already today. So next, please. So this slide illustrates the major steps in the evolution of the biosimilar pathway. So we started in Europe with the five-step approach you see on the left. Meanwhile, the approach in the middle is basically accepted by health authorities globally. And compared to where we started, we went away from meaningless animal studies. And on the clinical side, a study powered for a PD biomarker can replace a study with a conventional clinical endpoint. And for the future, we anticipate a streamlined and equally robust pathway based on analytical, which means physical, chemical, and functional comparison, followed by a clinical pharmacokinetic study. So in this approach, we do not need an, any comparative efficacy trial. Next. So on this slide, I listed the pivotal papers which describe the regulatory science and which show that such a streamlined clinical development is feasible already today. So they are, uh, are written by EU regulators. Uh, you will hear from uh, Guyen later on. Uh, from UK regulators, uh, Marie Bilske provided a very nice overview yesterday. And uh, also we from the biosimilar industry, we wrote the paper. Uh, and also, as a note, uh, an additional paper from EU regulators is coming up uh, shortly, and we will also hear about this later in the session. Next slide. So therefore, I will focus on uh, our review we did in our industry paper. And uh, what we did, we reviewed the value of clinical studies in the biosimilar development in Europe and in the US, and the data set reaches from the very early days of biosimilars until 2019. And the outcome in short was that the review revealed that comparative clinical efficacy was never a decisive criteria in biosimilar development. So we have seen successful biosimilar programs despite missing primary clinical endpoints. We have seen unsuccessful biosimilar candidates despite successful clinical efficacy trials, but which failed at the analytical and or the clinical BK level. So uh, this uh, uh, shows that Clinical efficacy was never a decisive criteria, which means we do not need those comparative studies from the retrospective manner. Certainly, it's now uh, to set up a, a framework which enables us to use this knowledge prospectively in the future um, regulation. The next slide. So when some of you might be surprised about these findings, um, it's not so much surprising to us to deal with, uh, since a long time in this area because we have a lot of safety nets already in place to ensure sameness of efficacy. The first safety net here is uh, the uh, comparison on the structural level. And as the function is the result of structure, if the structure is the same, also the function will be the same. Now, as uh, most of you know, we see minor differences in some quality attributes on a regular basis, and it's important to evaluate their impact on patients. Uh, but this can be done also by the next safety nets. Uh, with this, the um, confirmation of compar comparable binding with targets and receptors. And we typically know that those targets and receptors of a biotherapeutic 
uh, which can interact uh, with uh, the protein in the human body. And we can test them in a precise manner using binding assays. And we do not stop here. So we have another safety net, which is uh, the level at the cell-based bioassays, which measure uh, the biological effect that is triggered by the initial binding to the target and the receptors. This is done under native conditions in living cells. And uh, today, the, those assays are, can be done also in a very robust and a precise manner. So if those uh, safety nets are tight enough, we do not need uh, another safety net, which is the confirmation at the clinical efficacy level, which is relatively blunt. So in other words, uh, in a, such a streamlined development, the clinical confirmation of comparable efficacy is replaced by the stage of the functional characterization. Next slide. And um, as mentioned also yesterday many times, the functional characterization is a much more sensitive tool than clinical trials can be. And the trastuzumab case uh, provided us with nice data. It was also mentioned yesterday. So in this case, uh, it happened that the reference product uh, uh, batches had a pretty large temporary drop in ADCC potency, as shown here in this figure on the right. And those batches were uh, bought by two by similar developers, uh, which were just supplying their running comparative clinical efficacy studies. And uh, as a result, and if you click one more time, uh, you see that uh, the primary clinical endpoint was missed slightly. If you click uh, one more time, next please. Yeah, here you see the, um, the uh, uh, margins for the uh, clinical endpoint and also uh, how the data looked like, so it was missed slightly, but it shows that a very large difference in the uh, ADCC potency uh, resulted in a very small difference in, in the clinical endpoint, also showing the difference in sensitivity for differences. So if we go to the next slide. So um, sameness of efficacy is ensured very nicely without comparative efficacy studies, but what about safety and immunogenicity? So comparative safety is basically the, the result of the sameness of the structure and the functions, which result in the same efficacy and therefore in the same target-related safety. In other words, the safety profile of biotherapeutics is largely predicted from on-target effects. So co comparable safety results here in the comparable, uh, comparable efficacy results here in the comparable safety. And secondly, there are other uh, relevant factors such as levels of contaminants or process impurities, and they are controlled by today's quality standards. Now, ensuring comparable immunogenicity is equally straightforward. Uh, first of all, uh, comparable immunogenicity is largely ensured by the identicality of the amino acid sequence, resulting in the same T cell epitopes, which are normally peptides and also other minor risk factors such as aggregates or non-human glycanes, which may potentially increase unwanted immunogenicity, are controlled by proper specifications and also by today's quality standards. So this forms the foundation of comparable safety and immunogenicity. And in addition, the clinical PK trial delivers confirmatory safety and immunogenicity data on top. Next slide. Yesterday, also many speakers talked about the option to use PD biomarkers instead of conventional clinical endpoints. And although this is an accepted option globally, we see this as replacing one blunt tool by another, at least equally insensitive tool. And to illustrate this, um, uh, I provided you this slide where um, I, I collected um, studies on the um, neutrophil count, uh, which is a, an accepted PD biomarker for free breast teams. And uh, I did not find any dose response study in the literature, but one developer performed two consecutive PD studies, one with the therapeutic dose and the other with, the, uh, with only half of this dose, so 50% lower. And this translated in only a 13% uh, difference of the biomarker response. So in other words, the biomarker is uh, relatively insensitive for differences that even comparing uh, the therapeutic with half of the dose could result in the conclusion of no differences, even an 80 to 100, 125% equivalence margin. And certainly the caveat of this comparison is that this, is, this was not done uh, as a parallel study, 
but uh, it was done consecutively using the same uh, uh, study sites and also the same uh, analytical methodologies. Uh, next slide. Now, the US FDA um, performed three very nice pilot studies, as we also heard yesterday. So their aim was to fill knowledge gaps in the use of PD biomarkers for biosimilars. And I picked two of those studies uh, for il illustrative purposes on this slide. The left one uh, shows the simulated dose response curve for a PD biomarker of a monoclonal antibody, in this case against the IL-5. Uh, the issue here, as for most antagonists, uh, is the very small difference or the small range of the PDE response between the placebo noise, you see this as this uh, red uh, dotted uh, line, and the therapeutic dose. So there is very little room to measure a, a sensitive PDE biomarker, which has uh, issues with regard to measure measurability, uh, but also uh, is, uh, on the sensitivity for differences. So in this case, a 50% lower dose results at the max in only a 32% lower PD effect. And on the right-hand side is an example for an agonistic product, like interferon. And here, the distance of, uh, of the therapeutic dose to the placebo noise is much better. But still in simulated conditions, and this is a simulated uh, dose response curve, a 50% lower dose resulted in only 30% lower effect. And this was the simulated uh, difference. Uh, actually, those uh, levels are also measured in the pilot study, and the measured difference of a 50% lower dose was only 16%. So um, the study authors concluded that their studies may encourage the use of PD biomarkers. However, for us in the industry, the data showed very nicely that PD biomarkers, uh, because of their insensitivity uh, for differences, do not add additional decisive knowledge on top of what analytical data and clinical PK data can provide. So this leads me already to my concluding slides. So next, please. So um, we have seen that regulatory science has evolved and keeps doing so. And any study involving human subjects must take particular care to contribute new knowledge not otherwise obtainable. So we should only conduct clinical studies if they can provide decisive information. And non-decisive studies which use patients uh, should be used better of, uh, for studies for in new product development which foster progress in healthcare. So we have seen in the past that comparative clinical efficacy was never a decisive criteria in biosimilar development for EU and US. So we should leverage this knowledge uh, for upcoming regulation. And also as a note for the PD biomarker, which is seen by some stakeholders as a kind of yeah, solution uh, to make biosimilar development more efficient, uh, are, as we have seen, a, a rather blunt tool in biosimilar development and do not provide additional knowledge. And uh, we know that uh, for many biotherapeutics, uh, uh, there is no knowledge about quantitative PD biomarkers, but even if they exist, um, uh, they are not by itself uh, suitable for biosimilar development. So in the end, regulatory science enables the streamlined clinical biosimilar development without comparative efficacy studies based on a robust analytical package, including comprehensive panel of precise functional assays. And if you're talking about um, setting up a framework in, in, in making this in a robust manner, I think this is the, uh, the area we can focus on. And on top, uh, we do a comparative clinical PK study. That's all what I have, and uh, thank you for your attention. Many thanks, uh, Martin, for a very clear presentation. Before I move on to the next speaker, can I please remind the participant, when you put questions in the Q&A, please indicate whether this is a general question or whether it's a question that directed to one of the speakers. Um, and, and please do it every time, because otherwise we cannot triage the questions in, in the best uh, way. So please. Then with that, let's move on to the next speaker here and a colleague of mine, a specialist in clinical pharmacology from Spain, Elena Aguilien. And, and as Martin alluded to, Elena has done a lot of uh, research here. She has a lot of experience in biosimilars and other biotherapies. And she has been conducting uh, research into biosimilar regulation. She's been a collaborating national expert here at the European Medicines Agency. 
and she will present some of the results to you. So over to you, Elena, and thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you all for this opportunity. And so today I'm not quite talking from the industry perspective because I'm affiliated to an academic hospital. And what I will be presenting very briefly is some of the data included in two papers, which are part of my PhD. And with this presentation, I would like to focus on the analysis of quality data of monoclonal antibody biosimilars, of complex biosimilars, and give you an idea of the weight and strength and scrutiny of quality data in the marketing authorization procedures of biosimilars monoclonal antibodies. Um, next slide, please. So these are the two papers. One was published in January, the other is currently under review. And between both, we have included an analysis of a total of 23 monoclonal antibody biosimilars, which are examples of widely used biologicals that cover different indications, different mechanisms of action, also biosimilars with dual indications like rituximabs and also, and also withdrawn applications. Now I'm gonna be focusing mainly on the quality results because Elena Wolfholtz afterwards will present uh, further analysis on the clinical data and also on the marketing authorization outcome. Down here, you can see a complete list of the authors of both publications. Um, however, what I will say today are my personal views, and I'm not speaking on behalf of my university, the EMA, or any of the regulatory agencies which the authors are affiliated to. So uh, to, throughout my presentation, I'm going to try to answer three questions on the analysis of quality data. Um, next slide, please. So first of all, do we believe that there is sufficient evidence on biosimilarity from a quality perspective? So this first table represents what would be the full analysis of biosimilarity quality data of paper number two. And what can we see here? So first we see the columns, they represent uh, different approved biosimilars. So we have columns A to C for rituximab in this case, and columns D to I for trastuzumabs. And the rows, they represent the different quality attributes put into different subgroups. So we see potency assays, purity or glycosylation assays. And what do the patterns and colors mean? Uh, next, please. So what they represent is the percentage of biosimilar batches that have values within the similarity range of the European reference product. So the four most important categories are the um, dark solid green, which represents uh, when 100% of the biosimilar batches are within the similarity range for that quality attribute. Then we have the light green horizontal stripes when between um, 99 and 90% um, of the batches are within range. The light blue diagonal stripes when between 89 and 50% of the batches were within range. And then the dark blue dots when less than 50 of the batches were within range. And also when these quality attributes were not assessed by the manufacturer. Um, next, please. So what can we see in the table? So basically the very general view, what we can see is that on the one hand, we have areas that are markedly green. So this would be the areas where 100% of the batches of the biosimilar were within the range. So here we, we see them marked with a, with a red area. So we have content, we have the FAB mediated functions, the FC functionality, the complement mediated, you see these areas that are markedly green. And these represent mainly critical quality attributes. And then on the other hand, we see other areas where there's a bit more of patchwork. So a little bit more of colors and patterns, for, like we can see for the glycosylation or the charge variants. So these are areas where variability is expected. And also this patchwork is where we find the uncertainties in the evaluation of these products. So we also looked into how these uncertainties in the quality data were resolved, which I will also present in a bit. Um, but first, next slide, please. But here we have the same table for paper number two. So here we have the same analysis for adalimumabs, which would be columns A to G, and trastuzumabs, which would be columns to H to L. So here we find the same pattern repeating itself. We find areas that are markedly green, again, protein content, potency assays, FAB, FC functionality, especially for adalimumabs, and areas where a bit more patchwork, which is where we find the uncertainties. But these tables, they also show us another very important finding, which is the extent of quality information that is analyzed. So we've seen many rows that represent many quality attributes that are looked into, excluding those that we could not categorize because of anonymization issues. Next slide, please. But when we looked into all the analytical assays that were performed for these biosimilars, we also got these very long tables in paper number one. Um, next, please. 
So let's just take one example. So for instance, ADCC, which is now marked in red. So in the previous table, we saw that it was just one row, but we found that even that up for one biosimilar, it was tested using up to 20 different assays. So this already gives us an idea of the extent of information that is performed and the large variety of assays that can be used to study one single quality attribute. So now for the next question, how were these discrepancies, these quality discrepancies, so where we saw this patchwork, how were they resolved? What was further looked at if they looked into more quality data, clinical PK, efficacy, safety, immunogenicity? Next slide, please. So I'm going to give you just two examples uh, for the sake of time, but in our analysis, we found that this pattern repeated itself throughout the analysis of all the biosimilars we analyzed. So this, for instance, would be a table that summarizes the deviating results for Bebacizuma products. And let's just look at what I have marked in red. So as you can see, for instance, there was an instance where all products except one, the binding to the VEGF isoform 260 six was not markedly green, so not 100% of the batches within range, but we saw this patchwork. And how was this resolved? Well, this was resolved because it was viewed as sufficient based on binding to other VEGF isoforms that was confirmed using orthogonal methods. Next slide, please. And this would be the same table, but for rituximabs. So for instance, another example, we saw that all products had a variable result on the glycosylation profile. So a lot of patchwork where we saw, but this was accepted because similarity was confirmed in the cell-based assays and also because there were no clinically significant differences in the PK profile. So here in this last column, in the, in the how resolved column, you see a pattern that repeats itself and that repeated itself throughout the analysis of four different types of monoclonal antibodies, different mechanisms of action, different analytical and functional assays. And this is that in all cases, the residual uncertainties on quality data were resolved considering close similarity to demonstrated critical quality attributes, the results of PK studies, and overall the totality of the evidence. And as you can see, actually, the efficacy safety, uh, data played no role at all in, in addressing these quality concerns. So this further demonstrates that the quality packages are robust and predictive of clinical outcome. And now, uh, last but not least, we also looked into the withdrawn products. And what did we find for the withdrawn products? Um, next slide, please. So this is another table that we included in paper number two here. What we did is that we analyzed the outcome of the marketing authorization applications for all 36 monoclonal antibodies and fusion proteins evaluated by EMA. And we categorized them into five possible scenarios, indicating whether quality, PK, or clinical aspects were acceptable or not. So Elena Wolfholtz will explain the scenarios further, but I wanted to talk about scenario two, which you can see marked in blue. And here we have two products that did not get approved because of major issues in the quality dossier, but it's interesting to see that the clinical dossiers were deemed incorrect, were deemed correct, sorry. And we performed a more in-depth analysis of these quality issues. Next slide, please. And this is uh, the table that we constructed. So here, what we found is um, we, we can see on the, on the first slide, the key quality requirements and if they were or they were not met by the withdrawn applications. So here again, what we found is that not only are aspects regarding biosimilarity important, which is just the last line, but um, we also looked into the qu general quality issues. So for instance, sufficient number of reference product batches that are analyzed or the manufacturing process, or the comparability of clinical and commercial um, matches, or the use of appropriate methods. So in these withdrawn products, we found that less than half of these key quality requirements were met for either of them. And this further demonstrates the extent of quality data that is looked into. So as we have seen in the previous tables, that not only for analyzing biosimilarity, there are numerous orthogonal comprehensive methods that are used to analyze dozens of quality attributes, but moreover, there are other aspects really comprehensively looked into, like the comparability of the clinical and the commercial batches. Um, next slide, please. So just uh, to conclude, uh, and to summarize the key conclusions on, on the data on quality presented and to answer these questions that I have raised throughout the presentations, product comparability can be based solely on quality plus PK considerations as the extent of quality data analyzed is considerable. Also in our analysis of 23 different monoclonal antibody biosimilars, the biosimilarity exercise so to be markedly green for the cl critical quality attributes 
with the more varying concordance for other less critical quality attributes, which can be viewed as acceptable based on further quality analysis to resolve queries. And, more, and also, not only is biosimilarity an analyzed, but also general quality aspects are scrutinized. And as for how these quality queries were um, resolved, as we saw, there is some variability that is, it is, is expected and allowed, but more importantly, when we resolved the residual quality uncertainties, quality and PK data were looked into with actually no role of clinical efficacy safety data. And we have also seen for these two withdrawn products that had an unsatis unsatisfactory quality package that there were acceptable clinical packages, which further supports the insensitivity of clinical trials. So therefore, this data supports that there is sufficient evidence up to date that an assessment can be based on, can be made on a quality level. And um, that's all. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Elena, for, for reviewing those data. We move on to another Elena, namely Elena Borofolt. And uh, again, for those of you who have been dealing with biosimilars, Elena will be a, a, a well-known name for you. Elena has been the, the uh, chair of the Biosimilars Working Party here at the European Medicines Agency for the past six years. She has a long-standing experience working for the uh, Paul Ehrlich Institute in Germany. Um, Elena is a, is a medical doctor, has background. She has also some industry experience, and she has quite recently moved on to industry and is now participating here and speaking on behalf of Biocon. Nice to have you here, Elena, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Steph, and thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, and I see this as a as a very uh, big privilege. Uh, I also want to thank FDA for providing such a platform where, where really, truly, uh, this is a multi-stakeholder event. Uh, and um, uh, experts from um, different sides of the fence, so to speak, um, can uh, share share their views. Um, I really uh, believe that regardless which side of the fence uh, we are on, we are all motivated and passionate and concerned about bringing high quality, efficacious and safe, affordable biologics to the market. And the question is how? to do that and where does the evidence come from? And can we as a society, a global community still afford this comfortable totality of evidence, always have it all approach, or are we ready to introduce some efficiencies and not waste resources? The fear is of course, uh, of lowering the bar, lowering the bar that we compromise on our high standards on the achievement that patients deserve the very best products, whether reference product or biosimilar. And so we do need safeguards, we need gatekeepers that prevent poor medicine from reaching the market. But will clinical trials be such gatekeepers. And this is really the question that we continue asking ourselves. And uh, please move to the next slide. Um, Elena Guillen has introduced the two papers we have written as regulators. The uh, All the research was conducted before May of this year. And the second paper, that is how much does the outcome of clinical efficacy trials really matter, really is a true collaboration of uh, several regulators in Europe covering Ireland, Finland, Germany and Spain. Uh, and really involves clinical experts, quality experts, even the chair of the Biologics Working Party, Sean Barry, the vice chair of the Biosimilars Medicines Working Party, Niklas Ekman, and members of the Scientific Advice Working Party, as Sheila Kilalea and Martina Weiser, also as CHMP. Uh, members, so this is really um, a regulator's work, which I'm proud to present uh, on their uh, behalf. The remaining question, really, from the first paper, um, uh, when we went around and were very proud and we gave presentations at BMWP and the Scientific Advice Working Party and CHMP um, was, look here, 
um, we actually uh, have this wonderful quality data. And if less than 100% of the batches ever were within the similarity range for highly critical quality attributes, how is this actually resolved? Well, as Elena just pointed out, we go back to look at additional analytical and functional assays. And this is really what then critically will determine whether the quality um, assays perform the comparability exercise and also the general quality package is acceptable or not. Clinical data in this first publication did not help much. Uh, all were affirmative. All Adalimumabs or Bevacizumabs clinical trials were affirmative and therefore um, were just confirmative. So the criticism that we heard from other regulator colleagues was, well, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Obviously, um, this can only uh, be positive outcome um, because these were approved products. So then next slide, we asked ourselves, well, could it be that in the review process, there are critical questions also with regard to clinical data or even failed clinical trials, uncertainties in the clinical data that lead to other concerns or even major objections in the review process, major objections ultimately, if not resolved, would lead to a failed approval of the uh, product candidate. So would a failed clinical trial, would an uncertain clinical trial ultimately stop an approval process? And for this next slide, uh, we did several things. We, uh, number one, looked at thir the 33 antibodies and three fusion proteins that were reviewed uh, and um, then uh, ultimately assessed also in the past 10 years from 2012 to 2022. We also, uh, we looked at the EPARs, um, that is the outcome of a successful MAA, but also at the number and nature of the issues raised in the first regulatory assessment, which is the day 120 report. Obviously, this is um, confidential information and therefore only is presented uh, in summary fashion and anonymized. And we also did an in-depth ana analysis of um, another set of antibodies, that is four rituximabs and seven trastuzumab antibodies, and looked at the clinical data set there. Next slide. So with regard, next slide, to the outcome of the marketing authorizations, Elena Guillen has already introduced the different scenarios we looked at. The first scenario being that quality and clinical data were both viewed as supportive and aligned. So this was the case in 30 of 36 uh, products uh, that were reviewed, some initial uh, considerations and queries, which then got resolved in the process. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, the other was uh, introduced uh, by Elena Guillen, that is you have a failed uh, quality assessment, yet you still have affirmative clinical data, some issues about the one rituximab antibody, about safety data, I think there were eight more deaths, which were then found to be unrated related to the product. So basically also confirmative clinical data, which uh, did not, which were then viewed as not being sensitive enough to um, really show that there were problems with the quality data. Next slide. The third scenario uh, was that the quality data looked good. However, there was a failed, an initially failed PKPD trial. Um, and uh, this, uh, there was a root cause analysis and ultimately the trial uh, had to be done again uh, to rule out that there was actually a, a, a real problem, but otherwise uh, the data looked good. And the fourth scenario that there would be a problem with the uh, clinical efficacy uh, trial, the two uh, famous trastuzumab antibodies, which did not prevent approval of the drugs. The fifth scenario, a hypothetical scenario, which obviously we never saw. Next slide. Next slide. We then looked, had an in-depth look at uh, the rituximab and trastuzumab antibodies, including the withdrawn applications from a clinical point of view. Next slide. 
and um, found uh, uh, primarily then uh, the, the, the failed PK trials were in the ARA Limumab uh, group. Um, we actually accounted only uh, two in the overall analysis because um, if the uh, if there was an issue with the PK trial that could be resolved with further analyses which were pre-specified in the protocol, as was the case uh, with Julio, uh, that was not actually viewed as a as a failed trial as such. In the other instances, a root cause analysis uh, was performed, uh, and then a successful PK study was new PK study was submitted. Next slide. And here again with the failed clinical efficacy trial, uh, it is really uh, the trust to map cases uh, with the um, uh, uh, results uh, crossing the upper bound of the confidence interval, uh, as discussed before. But there are other secondary endpoints for other trust to map cases, bevazi to map cases, retook to map cases. It's not all listed here. Uh, these secondary endpoints, which would give the impression of uh, bio better or lesser product, would actually not be viewed as um, sensitive and work ultimately disregarded. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. The really interesting part is about the um, analysis of the major objections raised in the first assessment report, that is the day 120 report. Here you can see in, on the upper left that the majority of questions are really in the quality uh, arena. So 56% of the major objections that were raised upon review of day 120 were really related to quality. 19% to uh, PK and uh, PD, and 26% uh, to um, uh, the um, uh, efficacy, safety, and immunogenicity. When looking at the quality major objections, further interestingly, the majority, more than 70% of major objections were raised on general quality issues, and only about 25% on the comparability trial. Next slide. What were the issues with regard to clinical um, points? Well, with PK, it was about the investigation of the observed PK differences and differences in biosimilarity that uh, could be could be seen as such regarding PK. A clinical justification of the pre-specified margins, questions on the PD analysis, and a request for submission of individual patient data. Some former aspects, of course, with regard to efficacy, it's all about the primary endpoint. Is it failed or not? And is the reference uh, real in a sense in that, of course, um, it should match previous observations that have been published with the reference product? With regard to safety and immunogenicity, it's about the severity of adverse events, um, seeing uh, the as the type of ADAS and justification of uh, differences if they were seen. Next slide. Next slide. Here, this is really an interesting table because now we look at uh, what in, in weighing, um, where are the uh, major objections seen and compare the quality evaluations with the clinical um, observations. So left column, quality major objections, the uh, right columns, clinical major objections in PKPD or efficacy saving immunogenicity. So again, the question is, will the clinical major objections be a safeguard, a gatekeeper um, towards approving a product which uh, otherwise erroneously um, would uh, be approved? You can see, next slide, that in 25% of the cases, the Quality major objections were aligned with the clinical major objections in that they would prevent the approval of the drug. Uh, in row one, 
it is aligned just the other way. The quality major, there are no quality major objections, there are no clinical major objections. So in altogether 67% of cases, you would have the assessment aligned. Quality, good quality is reflected in good clinical work. Poor quality is reflected in poor clinical work. Next slide. Next slide. You would find in 11% of cases that the quality analysis as such would uh, raise a red flag and issues would need to be resolved by the applicant in order to get the drug on the market. Clinical major objections were not raised in these cases, so it was a um, divergent result. Next slide. The really interesting um, case is that you have very good quality data. Um, and the question is, will the clinical uh, data prevent um, the um, a product from getting to the market? Next slide. This is exactly, next slide. Case number three. Here you would have very good quality data, seemingly no major objections. The quality assessor says everything is fine, but we do have clinical observations that raise concern, major objections even, in the PKPD or and or efficacy, safety, and immunogenicity aspect. This is the case in 22% of cases. Here, the clinical assessment could really make a difference. We have observations that we're concerned about, that we say maybe the product isn't as good from a quality point of view that we think it is. The clinical trial proves it is not really where it should be, and we better do not approve the product. But is this actually the case? Next slide. It is not the case, because for these 22% of cases, the major objections were raised for the clinical part, but they were always eventually accepted. And the arguments were, well, there were imbalances in the trial arms, immaturity of secondary endpoint data at the time of the marketing authorization submission. There were changes in the quality attributes of reference products, so therefore you cannot hold it against the similar candidate. Some minor discrepancies could be chance findings. And in some cases, in further a further in-depth sensitivity analysis improved the understanding of the clinical data and facilitated a positive conclusion. So in any event, the analytical and functional characterization is most critical for the decision making and for ultimately the regulatory approval. Next slide. So what are our conclusions here? The concern that in the absence of comparative efficacy data, a biosimilar candidate might be inappropriately approved based on a seemingly good quality package only is not supported by data. Why? Seemingly good quality data will be a certain to be truly good quality data. This is the safeguard. And clinical data are viewed to be less sensitive and less conclusive and are therefore not really a safeguard. Next slide. So finally, in the first assessment of day 120, the 36 antibodies and fusion proteins evaluated by EMA, we found no instance where, mono, where the um, major objections or queries of clinical data, including failed efficacy trial, led to a negative overall decision. In no case were clinical trial data necessary to resolve residual uncertainties for the 23 antibodies that we looked at in uh, great depth. The quality part of the dossier appears to be predictive for the marketing authorization of a biosimilar candidate. And we strongly encourage a revision of the respective regulatory biosimilar guidelines in Europe and ultimately, hopefully globally, um, to uh, give uh, further guidance to the stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you to you, Elena, for a very uh, clear and uh, inspiring presentation. Um, I'm pretty sure there will be a lot of questions to, to those data. Let's move on to uh, not another Elena, but now to Frank, uh, Frank Schneider from Teva. Frank has a long experience uh, as a biotechnologist uh, working with manufacturing and, and biotech in different life science industries. Uh, in small pharma companies, but he's here today on behalf of uh, Teva, where he leads the clinical pharmacology and biosimilar 
PK studies and support scientific advice meeting with regulatory authorities. So over to you, Frank, and nice to have you here as well. Good morning, hello. Thank you for this introduction and thank you for inviting me to this workshop and for giving me the opportunity to talk about the role of clinical pharmacology data for waiving clinical efficacy studies. The next slide, please. In my presentation, I will talk about some specifics of the pharmacokinetics of therapeutic biologics and why the assessment of pharmacokinetics is more sensitive in the evaluation of residual uncertainties after the analytical and structural comparison of the biosimilar candidate and the reference product. I also will talk about the use of PD measurements in a clinical pharmacology study with biosimilars and the additional gain that we get from such a study. Next slide, please. Extensive knowledge is available about the pharmacokinetics of biologics. Uh, the pharmacokinetics are complex and they depend on diverse factors, such as the route of administration, physical chemical properties, and the binding. For instance, the physical chemical properties like the molecular weight, like the tertiary structure, isoforms, the charge and solubility can have an impact on the pharmacokinetics. And the binding to the neonatal FC receptor can influence the bioavailability. And the binding to the target may lead to target-mediated drug disposition and to nonlinear clearance. Usually the biologics are administered via the parental route and following the subcutaneous administration, absorption is affected by the transport through the extracellular matrix and pre-systemic elimination. And the distribution from the blood to peripheral tissue is slow and limited. Elimination of these drugs occurs via non-specific catabolism, target-mediated clearance and the formation of immune complexes. Differences in quality attributes between the biosimilar and the reference can therefore have an impact on absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Next slide, please. The advances in analytical techniques for the structural and functional characterization allow a thorough investigation of features affecting the potency of a biosimilar. So if the analytical results show there is high similarity regarding the features that determine the potency of a biosimilar, only changes or differences in exposure may have an impact on the efficacy. The exposure itself, uh, it's more difficult to determine because of the multiple nonspecific factors that can affect the administration, distribution, metabolism, and excretion as shown on, on the previous slide. In a PK study, we can investigate the overall effect of differences in quality on the exposure. In a PK study of many biosimilars, we can test the PK in the population of healthy subjects, with, which is the most sensitive population. Most biologics are target specific and they have a large therapeutic window and only limited off target toxicity and the PK endpoints have a lower variability compared to patients because of less confounding factors. We are also able to have a higher sampling frequency and therefore can better characterize the concentration time curves. For the PK equivalence testing, usually we require lower sample size compared to efficacy, again, indicating the, the higher sensitivity of the PK compared to efficacy endpoints. Due to the large therapeutic window, the maximum effect is often reached at doses below the recommended dose. And this means that efficacy endpoints are not sensitive to more changes in exposure. Next slide, please. The biosimilar guidances request the use of PD markers. 
However, pharmacodynamic PD measures are not optimal endpoints for similarity testing. And my opinion should be used according to their relevance. Qualified biomarkers are rarely available for our biosimilar developments. And the available PD data from the reference product are often not sufficient to establish a meaningful equivalence margin to do a formal equivalence testing. On top of this, and Martin talked already a little bit about this, there's high variability of the PD measure of most of the PD measures. And if we have low expression levels in healthy participants, then this also leads to low sensitivity. However, pharmacodynamics may contribute to similarity assessment and interpretation of PK results if the measured molecule have a direct impact on PK. So for instance, concentrations and variability of target molecules can affect the pharmacokinetics of a drug in a case where we have relevant target mediated drug exposure. And in such a case, we should determine the level and we should know the level of the molecule in order to select the appropriate population and to ensure bias, uh, to ensure that we have comparable treatment groups. Next slide, please. There are additional gains from such a clinical pharmacology study. In such a study, we, we are able also to assess the safety, the local tolerability, and the immunogenicity. Safety and tolerability can be assessed, blinded, and more frequently. And therefore, we are able to discover even transient changes of safety parameters. And the innate acute tumoral immune response can be assessed after a single dose. The comparison of anti-drug antibodies in healthy participants in contrast to patients, it's not biased by the presence of other drugs or immune complexes. And the new technologies and assays and also the revised guidances provided us better assessments of anti-drug antibodies and neutralizing potential. And now we have assays that are more sensitive and have a higher drug tolerance. The need to evaluate formation of ADA after repeated dosing should be determined in a risk-based assessment. In a clinical pharmacology study, as mentioned, we can have extensive sampling and therefore we can assess the drug concentration, anti-drug antibodies and where required pharma pharmacodynamic measures over time and evaluate all the possible correlation between these parameters. Next slide, please. So I would like to conclude that following a structural and functional analytic comparison of biosimilar candidate and the reference product, the pharmacokinetics provides the most sensitive measure to evaluate residual uncertainties. Thank you for your attention. Also, thank you to, to Frank for highlighting these important uh, issues um, uh, around the, uh, the PKPD and, and potential to use that um, for, for biosimilar assessment. We move on uh, in our range of speakers here. The next speaker is uh, Keith Watson. Uh, Keith is an independent regulatory consultant and he has more than 20 years experience working with biologicals and biosimilars both in industry and as a consultant. He also worked previously at the uh, UK Regulatory Authority, the MHRA, and he has an extensive experience also working by that in the European uh, system. So uh, over to you, Keith, to uh, give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, thank you very much to the IPR committee and all these stakeholders for giving me the opportunity to, to talk today. Um, next slide, please. Um, I've been involved in um, development of biosimilars and biologics for many years in various roles on both sides of the fence. And I think what I'm going to do is take a bit of a step back and sideways here and um, really sort of talk about um, do or what are the risks, if you like, of or, or, or losing the clinical efficacy study. And and, and my, my point is really going to be that I think we've stepped away what, what away with biosimilars and what fundamentally is a comparability exercise. And I think 
historically words uh, words have mattered and that we've seen by similarity as being different to comparability and my personal view is is that i don't think it is and if you look at the the totality of evidence and the history that we have with comparability particularly the regulators and, and, and sponsors of industry, we, we will see that very rarely are clinical trials needed to manage, in some cases, uh, equally complex changes that have been seen. And um, notwithstanding that they cumulative cumulative changes with the biosimilars, I do think we need to just take a bit of a broader holistic view to see um, you know, what's happened over the last 10 or 20 years, particularly benchmarking to ICHQ5V. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So in terms of biosimilar development, I mean, it's often been said there's there's a lot of unknown to biosimilars. It's, it involves a different process. Um, I will contest it doesn't really. I mean, the manufacturing of biological products, particularly monoclonal antibodies and other recombinants, is quite well established. It's generally a conservative industry. Um, you know, the cell lines that are used are often um, Broadly, they're, they're, they're often similar. They're, they may be CHO, they may be SP20s, there may be different clones of them, but fundamentally, they're, they're, a lot is known about them. How to characterize these cell lines is, is well known. There's guidelines there. There's, there's CROs who can do it for you, as well as doing anything else. There's also a lot of prior knowledge available, only from the, uh, literature, EPARs, regulatory approvals, companies' knowledge, which can be brought to bear. So I, I don't see that necessarily this concept of different cell lines, um, you know, are, are going to pose different challenges. They're the same challenges that are applicable to a, anyone who's developing either a new product or or a biosimilar. And, and there's plenty of opportunities to use existing tools to, to make sure they're consistent. Similarly, with manufacturing processes, again, they're conservative. The, the purification of monoclonals is often a series of, you know, obviously fermentation, but then purification is a series of uh, capture steps, uh, um, polishing steps, followed by the UFDF functions and filtration steps. So very, there's very little variability in terms of the unit operations. And again, I think this is recognised that you also have companies apply platform approaches for their, for their portfolios, which, you know, so they're, they're very confident they can transfer a different monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies or, or other products into their, into their platform because they're confident that it will be producible and consistent and they understand the control mechanisms that are needed. Even moving on towards the, the quality attributes, again, a lot more is known. And, and I think I would be bold to say that a lot of that's been driven by, by similar companies. Um, the understandable um, conservatism at the beginning of our similarity to require that efficacy study, I think, is, was well, well founded. Um, there was initial concerns. I can remember some of the early discussions that monoclonal antibodies weren't particularly well characterizable. Um, and we soon showed that in theory they, they, they could be, and that the tools have evolved. And a lot of those tools have evolved in part because the biosimilar developers have been under pressure from the regulators and, and you know, to, to sort of get their product accepted and approved to, to improve on those in terms of their ability to discriminate and to quantify. And you can quantify it down to the level of the amino acid. And, and, and not only can, can you do that, they're also sensitive to discriminate. And, and, these, and these assays are not unique to either innovators or, or unique to um, biosimilar developers. They're, they're assays that are, are out there that can be modified and, and sort of be tweaked, obviously, for the product and in different hands. But also the key assays have to be qualified and validated. And again, these assays, there's guidelines to support that. So the idea that these are being done randomly or sort of in the hands of people who don't understand what to do with limited control, I think, is, is not, not really true. And I think after 15 or, or 20 years now, by similar development, I think in a sense that the, the, the paradigm has been proven. But more importantly, we should now consider it against comparability. Because one, I think for me, the way I would address by similar development is it's simply a comparability process or comparability assessment between a reference product and a, and a biosimilar product. Biosimilarity is a word I think is, is, is a, a misnomer. That's just, you know, it's just, it just seems to differentiate from what is essentially a comparability exercise. And most importantly, regulators and industry have significant experience of comparability assessments over many years, going back to the, the iteration and, and the publication of ICHQ5V. Next slide, please. So, you know, most of us, you know, everyone here, all the regulators are aware of ICHQ5V. I mean, it's essentially a risk-based approach and, and um, the, the, the default position is that you should, in theory, be able to you know, complement your changes or, or confirm any changes you make in your process in the post-approval environment or, or you know should be able to be demonstrated through quality functional assays to, to be similar and um 
and if there is issue, if there are issues, then obviously you may or may not use non-clinical models, although their, their utility is, is, is pretty much then, uh, seen as irrelevant. Or worst case, they have to do some clinical. And I think we also have to recognise that in some cases, certain clinical studies are mandated for manufacturing changes. It's, it's agnostic and irrespective of the quality. It's not a, it's not about the quality. For example, formulation changes, new routes of administration are going to require some clinical data. So. But the vast majority of manufacturing changes that are done by, by similar companies and by innovative companies are managed quite successfully with uh, CMC, analytical functional data. Um, and there's very few cases, notwithstanding not everything is published, but there's very few cases where, you know, you know, you know that certain um, clinical studies was, were done. And, um, you know, uh, like I said, change of formulation is a common requirement. And occasionally when there's been shifts in uh, or change in bioreactor or shifts in profiles where companies uh, have done it um, because of a request of the uh, regulator or, or in, in order to confirm internally that their comparability. Next slide, please. So if you think, and this comes from the EMEA's own website. So if you think about it, there's been a good to the stage now that we are asking to use different approaches to assess the same thing. I mean, on the bottom left here is the, the cartoon from the EMA's website that shows you batch variability with refer any products. This could be a biosimilar product that's approved. It's, it's the variability of a biological product. And on the on the right cartoon is the, the you know the theoretical variability of a reference medicine and a biosimilar medicine. And yet the expectation for the cartoon on the left is that you should not, outside of certain changes, you should not require clinical data to support it. Um, you know, most companies probably wouldn't make the change if their quality profile shifted so much that they were worried they wouldn't need clinical data. And certainly the regulators would unlikely accept it. So in, in many regards, the, it seems odd and incongruous that for mo monitoring similar variability, you would expect it to always default to an efficacy study. To me, it doesn't make sense scientifically and it doesn't make sense from a regulatory perspective. Next slide, please. Now. Since the onset of biosimilar development, there's been an evolution in analytical platforms. Um, similar slides have been put up earlier by uh, our, our speakers, but fundamentally, the 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 approach taken to you know determine or develop a biosimilar is an absolutely comprehensive approach and quite understandable. And I think often what's also forgotten is not simply a comparability exercise. There's also it's also incumbent on the developer of the biosimilar to make sure they've got a consistent manufacturing process. So the whole the module three section is no different to that of an innovators in respect of managing and controlling your manufacturing process, your control strategy, generating your own stability data, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, they, they're simply got to develop a process first that is capable of consistently producing a molecule that is able then to be shown to be comparable to a reference product. And the tools listed here, I mean, they're non-exhaustive, but some of these are uh, you know, th these are used routinely in many cases, and this, I would argue, this platform has evolved and developed in part because of the development of biosimilars over the years, and now has become, and, and I've, I've also contested in many cases, certain comparability changes now also uh, uh, now require some tests that were perhaps not previously done particularly around FC mechanisms. I mean, 10, 12 years ago, these mechanisms may have been known, but very few products or many, many products weren't designed to have FC functionality. It was almost a, a serendipitous finding or, or secondary. And now that more and more things have been you know, are known about it, it's become almost the rigor to, to test that term. Even, I think we have to be clear, even with biosimilars, if there's if it's not expected to have FC functionality or ADC, there still is a requirement often from the regulators to at least test a couple of batches to confirm a negative, which you could also argue is in some respects, a, um, it's good belt, a belt and braces approach. It's also a little bit uh, odd that you're asked to test for a negative, but nonetheless, it's a robust process that's been used and and um, and, and, sit, and it's no, no different in my view to a comparability process. Next slide, please. Again, here you've got, uh, um, the concept of orthogonal testing. This is this is a, a basically a cartoon that shows you sort of theoretical critical quality attributes for for a, a biologic and all the tests that you could be doing and you know to to you know make sure you've got a good hold and handle and control on on all of these. And and, and again, you know, don't underestimate the level of uh, analytical, structural, and functional assays that are used to determine that these two products are the same. Uh, um, and I think the paradigm has been well uh, well rehearsed now. And I think 
we need to start to get back to, to what the science tells us, that for 25 years, assessors have happily considered compar- you know, process change, whether it's cell line changes, whether it's site transfer, scale up, whether it's whatever, a combination of, you know, different changes. They've been happy to consider those, but even back in the day when analytics weren't as sensitive, arguably, without the need for, for, for clinical studies. So we're now moving into a space where there's more interrogation being done by more specific, more sensitive assays, and yet we still concede or believe that there may be a need for an efficacy study, which doesn't make sense. It's not set up, nor is it sensitive to detect structural differences. You couldn't conceivably design a study to measure the structural variation, no more than you could do an immunogenicity study to, to, to consider, you know, a true immunogenicity study um, to look at minor differences. And, and you can, you know, the and I think that the analogy is pretty much the old fashioned analogy of a duck. If it looks like a duck, it, it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's likely to be a duck for better or for worse. And I think that the bar the paradigm has been proven. I, I don't think, in my view, that we need to um, persist any more with the concept that the efficacy study is going to add any value. It's not sensitive. It doesn't add anything to the analytics. You know, um, and there's maybe discussion. There's always going to be discussion around how you then can perhaps, or what, when do you, when do you get that sort of buy-in from the regulators of how much data you need before they will give you that permission to proceed. But again, there's plenty of opportunities to 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 have sort of uh, with current assessment processes, which we can perhaps discuss at panel later, that that can be managed. Next slide, please. Now, this this is look busy. This slide. This is a sort of thing that's a follow-on work from Al Samuel Patel, uh, which follows on from work of Schneider and and Verzier, which looked at manufacturing changes, and um, and this essentially looked at the anti TNF over a 10, 20 year period. Um, and what they did is they looked at all the manufacturing, manufacturing changes of innovators and biosimilar companies, and they, they, they stratified them according to low, medium and high risk based on the guidelines in the, the European Commission regulation document. And essentially, of the 801 or 800 changes that were applicable for both originators and biosimilars, most were classified as low risk and a few were classified as high risk. Um, however, a few important points here, I think, is that so there was no difference in the, in the changes between biosimilars in the classifications between biosimilars and innovators. Um, more importantly, there's no evidence of any safety or efficacy concern, not only from the, 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 the EPARs and the data that's out there, but also from changes to label, changes from farm vigilance signaling over the years. They've always, they've actually all been managed by analytical and functional evaluation, besides the exceptions that we've spoken around formulation changes, um, which we wish are mandated actually. So this is like, that's agnostic of quality. Uh, and, and I think we have to start to perhaps re-educate in, in a nice sense, you know, the, 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 um, the assessors to say, look, what you, you know, you could be working on a manufacturing change for a cell line or something else, and you'll be happy with analytics. You step next door to do a biosimilar, and you're going you're gonna to scream if there is an efficacy study, even though you're seeing the same types of data, and that efficacy study doesn't tell you anything. So I think moving away from the term biosimilarity, it, to me, it's, it's a misnomer. It's not. It's a biosimilar product that is developed based on a comparability exercise. Would be helpful. Next slide, please. And I think you know we, we've got to we've got to start thinking wider and more broadly. We've had over twenty years of manufacturing process change, which considered probably every possible combination of changes that can occur. We've seen different formulations, different devices, different routes scale ups, different sites. We even have the possibility of facility fit differences where the same manufacturer could, you know, for maybe using a CMO could have a slightly different process listed, you know, and, and so fundamentally there's, there's very little that hasn't been seen and been managed mainly by CMC um, before. And the PK study is, is absolutely obviously man, mandatory and, 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 and essentially that you know, would would guarantee that the formulation, the device combination, and the you know, and and the, the quality attribute profile that are there are, are showing that you know, if once they reach that site, they're they're distributed in, uh, equally um, in in the in the patient or the volunteer, and then once they reach that site, the expectation is they'll be a for better or for worse as, as as like each other. So my view is that from take a holistic approach, don't just think of you know, removing something, why, why is it actually needed? What have you done before? And we've got 20 years now of comparability data, 15 years of biosimilar data. 
And um, there's no evidence at all from post-marketing, from the e pass from the labels, that none of this can be managed about, with, with that none of this requires efficacy studies. So next slide, please. This is just a list of all the references there. And uh, once again, uh, next slide, please. I think this just summarizes some of the papers out there. And what I would say is let science and experience be the driver of the decision making rather than conservative thinking or wordology. And I think the data has shown that the efficacy study is, is redundant. I mean, I think the discussion should focus more on how we deliver and guarantee that we've got surety of the data before we proceed to the phase one rather than focusing on when or not we remove the efficacy study. But thank you for your time and, um, and the opportunity to talk. Thanks a lot, Keith, for making the case clear for abandoning clinical and comparative efficacy studies. We move on in our uh, range of presentations here. Now it's the time to turn to Fabrice Romanev, who is a senior vice president at the Atrocinus Capri Biopharmaceutical Business Unit um, and uh, has a long standing experience also in this area. As you notice now, we only have very experienced speakers at this panel, um, 17 years here and more, um, been involved in biopharmaceuticals and uh, is also involved in the, um, in the US Association for, for, bio, for Biosimilar Forum and Medicines for Europe. So also a lot of regulatory and governmental affairs activities from Fabrice's side. So thank you for coming here Fabrice and the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan, for the introduction and good day to everyone. I actually just noticed that we are now about 550, 560. So it's a truly uh, exciting experience to have the opportunity to present in front of you. Um, the previous panelists have shared evidence of argumentation as to how the wealth of scientific data collected so thus far on biosimilar is really advocating and urging for a global science-led revision of the guidelines aiming for streamlined development. In my presentation, I will be addressing the economical evidence and the underlying pressure being placed on the sustainability of biosimilar development. Next slide. Patients are often left with older, fewer effective medicine due to the sheer burden of healthcare cost to the system. It is actually foreseen a pressure on the global healthcare system of 1.9 trillion US dollar by 2027, with an ever increasing number of deaths related to non communicable disease rising up to 70%. According to the WHO, about 2 billion patients do not have access to essential medicines, which is combined with a massive disparity between highly developed countries versus rest of the world countries where access to effective medicine is even more difficult. A US example is while less than 2% of the American used biologics, they represent 40% of the total spending on prescribing drugs. This is unsustainable and leaves only the wealthy to reap the benefits of biologics. Next slide, please. Therefore, biosimilar are really vital for patient access to biologics and can significantly improve life expectancy and morbidity. The promise of an increased access to affordable medicine has been supported by WHO in their 2014 resolution, advocating for the availability of biosimilar, expecting a fair competition and a reduction of the average price of treatment. The industry really welcomed the WHO revision of the guideline on biosimilar, which clearly noted that state-of-the-art analytical and PK study may be sufficient for biosimilar de biosimilarity demonstration, even for complex molecules. So enabling a path to competition for biologics to biosimilars is a key to reducing costs and facilitating more innovation. Policy and regulatory decisions that we make today are going to have a lot to do with whether we realize the promise for this category of products. Next slide, please. We do observe that healthcare professional and patient community rely on biosimilar. As for any new category of drug, it took proper education to explain the science behind and the robustness of the analytical comparability. Um, some well-designed guidelines to safeguard the pathway of biosimilar development, and most importantly, real-life demonstrated experience to allow the adoption of biosimilar. 
Just so these days, we count nearly 5 billion patient day of experience. Can you go to, actually, we're not on a good slide. Can you go to, yes, next slide. Again, yeah, this one. Click, click again, and we stop here. Um, while we are actually increasing the patient access and gaining trust from the medical community, the biosimilar estimated saving by 2027 are expected to reach $300 billion. So far, biosimilar have fulfilled its promise, but let's have a look at the future. And let's move to the next slide. When defining the future portfolio, biosimilar development must consider multiple factors such as intellectual property, pricing dynamic, and cost of R&D, and more. If we do look a little bit more closely at these three factors, there are and there remain barriers to portfolio consideration, such as the patent ticket that are allowing the biologics innovator to stay on the market for many, many years and more years than initially intended, extending their monopoly. Vertical interpayer issues, but also lastly, as the finance govern feasibility for biosimilar, as well as for other medicines, uh, the biosimilar development, even after 15 years of, of experience and market experience and regulatory experience, still take eight to 10 years and cost of $100 million, which does represent a significant barrier to innovation and fair competition. In other words, I'm asking that we are asking this question. Can the biosimilar system afford brand innovator like development cost with generic pricing? I speak to you today to plead a call for regulatory action for patients worldwide. Next slide. I really want to draw your attention on this important slide. A recent study from IQVA indicates the future that future of biosimilar is uncertain. There is around half of future biologics that are predicted to not be copied. From our own appraisal, this includes non-blockbuster biologics, orphans, oncology molecules, where the cost of the R&D versus the return investment that make them untenable uh, for global biosimilar developers. Collectively, this gap would lead to a very large loss of savings. We do have more than 15 years of regulatory experience with biosimilar now, along with significant post-marketing surveillance. Although the reasons for this gap are multifactorial, all efforts to evolve development guidelines to pursue streamlining when scientifically justified is now very urgent uh, to bridge this gap and to avoid that it, this gap is widening, reducing R&D costs significantly by waiving the clinical efficacy studies is likely to enable more developers to copy more biologics, thus future-proofing the biosimilar mission for both payers and the patient, indeed. Now, I'd like to introduce you to a couple of illustrations of development barriers. So let's move to the next slide. If we take the example of oncology product, uh, the barrier entry is even higher as the clinical trial are expected to demonstrate equivalence through a sample size that could go up to thousands, ten thousands of patients, if we take the example of pertuzumab. Cost of conducting trials in oncology are notoriously three to four times higher than non-oncology biosimilar, to which we can add up uh, the cost of reference product and also the technical complexity of manufacturing new oncology drugs, such as anti-drug conjugate. All that together does put the barrier of feasibility at a level almost impossible for the biosimilar developers. Finally, and as we've heard during day one of this IPRP workshop, we must consider best usage of patient pool in oncology and thus pressure test the utility of very large trials in oncology for biosimilars to avoid potentially taking oncology patients away from innovative trials. On the next slide, there is another example uh, where we can see the relatively high reference material product price illustrated in the case of the orphan drugs. Some of these drugs can cost up to a couple of millions per annum. So now let's pick a picture a biosimilar developer aiming for 4 analytical characterization and, and comparability versus the originator. And on top, 
uh, having to run a clinical efficacy study with repeated administration of this very expensive originator in the co a comparator arm. So the development constraints out of these two, hopefully you will have gathered um, examples, uh, are really onerous, expensive, and most probably prohibitive. Next slide. Going a little bit uh, in the future now, while the monoclonal antibodies have composed the majority of the biosimilar developed and commercialized so far, um, we, we need to think ahead of the game. So policy and regulatory decisions that we make today are going to lead what we're going to do in the future. So such as tackling some gene therapy, CAR T and mRNA technology. Consequently, while we are while there is a need to redefine the current paradigm based on years of overwhelming experience, we also uh, need the regulators to provide regulatory certainty on also uh, this new category uh, for the biosimilar sponsor development. Next slide. We need clarity, evolution of the existing guide guidance but we are designed with the genuine intent to guardrail the progress of a new category of drug in somewhat uncharted territories. To that, we can no longer say because the body of evidence demonstrating efficacious, safe, and well-adopted biosimilars is irrefutable. If the science-led evolution of the guideline is materially moving towards the right direction after this important IPRP workshop, it is equally important to strive for regulatory convergence, aiming for guidelines that are considerate of truly worldwide global development, avoiding uh, the developers to have to uh, add some additional bridging um, studies and trials. On the next side, I would like to conclude my presentation by telling you that Biosimilar did deliver their mission so far. But their sustainability is uncertain. Uh, there is a great threat uh, that half of the biologic won't be copied. One of the key reasons being cost of development. With more than 15 years of regulatory experience, we urgently need converged guideline evolution. I thank you for your attention and the great opportunity to contribute to this important debate. Many thanks, uh, Fabrice, for highlighting these important uh, issues uh, and aspects of, of developing products using uh, comparative efficacy studies. We move on to the last presenter before a brief break. Uh, that's uh, Gillian Woolett. And uh, Gillian uh, starts out as with an MA in biochemistry and has a lot of experience in different uh, pharmaceutical companies. Now she is working with Samsung Biopis in since 2021, sorry, uh, in the US. And she's also the chair of the International Generics and Biosimilar Association and its Biosimilars Committee, uh, and has been a lot, a lot involved in, in policy uh, around biosimilars. And uh, I'll give the floor to you, Gillian, for the last words in this round. Great, thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers for the invitation. And I'm gonna speak on behalf of IGBA, the International Generics and Biosimilar Medicines Association. Next, please. As indicated, I'm an employee of Samsung BioEpis and Samsung BioEpis is a member of the Biosimilars Forum, the US Trade Association for Biosimilars and of Medicines for Europe. I'm the co-chair of the International Generics and Biosimilars Association, IGBA Biosimilars Committee, along with Giuseppe Randozzo of the Alliance for Accessible Medicine. However, I want to emphasize that all errors and omissions in this presentation are ultimately entirely my own. Next, please. So our aspiration, one science, one quality, supporting global access access being a critical point that you've heard from the previous speakers, but also, next please. Biologics offer promise for treatment and cures for a very broad range of unmet medical needs. Obviously, they're an expanding area for biopharma in terms of development of new medicines, 
And when the intellectual property expires, biosimilars can create affordable access worldwide. Next. The cost to approval for a biosimilar, however, is about a hundred times that of a small molecule generic drug. And the time of development is extensive, it's seven to 10 years. So to have biosimilars available to less commercially successful biologics does depend upon improving the efficiency of their development. And this includes reducing unnecessary comparative efficacy studies, CES. Next. Efficient development relies on predictable science-based regulatory approaches that themselves are kept current and consistent across jurisdictions, often referred to as regulatory reliance. And this alone, by being consistent, increases confidence in the regulators themselves because consistency, as we heard from Keith, is independent of any business model if biosimilarity is essentially, for instance, a comparability exercise. Next. Sustainable markets with fair competition, getting to what Fabrice just presented, will ultimately decide how broad access can be. But obviously on these, this series of, of meetings, biosimilar development and approval are essential as the first step. Nobody has access to the product that is not approved in the first place. Next, please. So we want this consistent use of established, and I will emphasize as De Keith, just how established these regulatory scientific principles are, because this gives confidence in all biologics, in for all regulators everywhere globally. There's no different standard for biosimilars compared to originator biologics. Now, FDA's comparability protocol was in 1996, and indeed I was at Pharma when we discussed it and created it as guidance. It ultimately became ICHQ5E, and it enabled biologics to evolve, such as new manufacturing sites, replacing equipment suppliers, and various other changes. But it was critical to facilitating greater availability of what were then only originator biologics. And in that guidance, it already says that determinations of product comparability can be based solely on quality considerations if the manufacturer can provide assurance of comparability through analytical studies. This is a direct quote. Comparability established critical quality attributes as this basis of sameness, and they're prioritized for their potential clinical significance and used in a head-to-head -head comparative manner. So this is already something we've been doing for decades, arguably 27 years. This regulatory science then led the way for biosimilarity, which is also based on analytics, with limited confirmatory comparative efficacy studies. And in the US, comparative efficacy studies are already entirely waverable as a matter of law. Next. I can't emphasize enough this critical nature of review consistency, and it's an absolute priority within and across regulators for the industry. Nothing we're proposing here is attempting to in any way cut corners. However, I would like to emphasize, you either have to believe in critical quality attributes or you don't. And if you do believe them in them, they must apply independent of this business model. We are actually emphasizing for biosimilars, we don't want anything special, we want consistency. Next click. So one science, one world with a level of regulatory reliance that can then share the workload by enabling efficiency everywhere. That's sharing the workload for sponsors, that's sharing the workload for regulators. Next, please. So as was just alluded to by Fabrice, there's already hiccups in the pipeline for future biosimilars that are visible. Nearly half of the biologics facing loss of exclusivity within the next 10 years have no biosimilars in development. Next click. And here in this IQVIA report, it's available, it's public, it's open. Here's the 50% and they represent 86 billion at the moment in terms of the, the cost of those biologics. Next click. So science-based regulatory streamlining 
may increase the number of these originator biologics to which biosimilars are developed. That pulls those candidates within the next 10 years that face LOE into being perhaps re-evaluatable as candidates for biosimilars, given that a biosimilar development, as I emphasized earlier, is seven to 10 years. So it's really critical. There's an urgency to this decision if they are to become viable candidates. And that's why we are emphasizing the time dependency of streamlining. Next click. Regulatory reliance can increase patient access in additional markets for those biosimilars that have already been, are being developed for the principal markets. Right now, that's Europe and the US. Next click. That we can do this as a scientific matter without risk to patients, this is the regulatory streamlining, suggests it would be a very wise approach to follow. So on behalf of the industry as a whole, I would like to emphasize both the urgency, but also this is without a compromise in quality, safety, or efficacy of the products we're proposing be approved. Next, please. And getting again to the earlier speakers, our experience supports global streamlined development. The science, as you've heard both yesterday and today, is asked and answered, and there's an urgent need for the regulations to catch up. And I realize that is not a trivial ask. When one's got regulatory requirements, it can be quite cumbersome, but we've already shown that there's no regulatory value to animal studies, or routine comparative efficacy studies. Next click. So the new model can do away with the non-clinicals. Next click. The comparative efficacies. Next click. And you can see a reduction therefore overall in the data needed to establish biosimilars, but with no compromise in the products. Next click. So this would enable this approach a substantial reduction in the data burden, but for no net change in regulatory competence. Next click. The reduction in time and cost, we hear a lot about cost, but the time is important too. Both will impact the feasibility of biosimilar development, especially to non-blockbuster reference products. Fabrice alluded to orphans, but there's also a big cohort in between orphans and blockbusters that are currently not targets for biosimilars that it's important to consider. Next click. So regulatory streamlining fundamentally can make more biosimilars feasible. Next click. And Reliance expands access and affordability with no change in quality, safety, and efficacy. Everything we're proposing is based on where the science of comparability is today rather than maybe where it was presumed to be 20 years ago. Next slide. Single global development for originators and biosimilars is efficient. Here is a slide that shows how the originator product is the same globally. If we have a global originator, it must be feasible to have a global biosimilar as well. And if you look at this table in red, are the pivotal studies upon which the approval in US, EU, Canada, Australia depended for each of those six products listed on the left. And of course, the innovator products are those products to which biosimilars are being made. The experience with the innovators is extensive, but they are the same as themselves over their lifetime because their approval was based on the same clinical trials material used in the same pivotal clinical studies. Next click. So the reference product is by definition global when the pivotal clinical data are the same across jurisdictions. And this is confirmed when additional indications are added. The same clinical studies supporting those indications are submitted across multiple jurisdictions. And often this is public. This data we published in 2017 was from the FDA and European websites, as well as the websites Canada, Australia. Next click. So straight away, we can make the case that no unnecessary bridging studies, especially PK, but also 
the comparative efficacy studies are needed, and this today would support more efficient development and enable earlier access to more jurisdictions. Next slide, please. So next key point is regulatory predictability is key to efficient feasible development. Sponsors have to be confident in what is going to be required of them in a manner that they can afford to not do some of the studies we've all as an industry got used to doing today. Next click. But the point being that if we can bring the regulatory decision sooner, it doesn't change the nature of the product that's finally approved, especially the subsequent markets. So when biosimilars are made, they are designed, they are developed, they are analytically matched, they don't get changed during development. There's no tweaking that goes on. The data is collected and the match is confirmed analytically with PK. But if we can bring the decision sooner, the costs go down radically and the time to develop can go down as well. Next click. So getting biosimilars to market more quickly, more efficiently with no compromising quality matters for each and every jurisdiction. Again, emphasizing one product for all markets globally. Companies are not gonna make different products for different markets. And if they're approved in the highly regulated markets first, there's considerable experience before they reach other markets. Next click. So this is a genuine question as to what can the regulator in the next market ask for that the previous one hasn't considered? Now, we're not arguing for mutual recognition, but we are saying as a scientific and regulatory matter, are there any residual uncertainties at that point that should be being addressed? This is the case for reliance. This may be the case for the WHO's shared procedures on the so-called CRP. There are ways forward that may be important that we can, as an industry, contribute to to facilitate broader availability earlier than just the priority markets. But this issue, question number two, what can the regulator in the next market ask for, is something I think we would like to pursue a further discussion on. Next, please. So the conclusions. The time is now. Global access to biologics, including biosimilars, depends on the following. Next. Streamlining biosimilar development with no unnecessary comparative efficacy studies is absolutely essential to their expanded availability to more originator biologics. It's fundamentally critical to the feasibility of making biosimilars. The current costs of development per product 100 times the average generic are just not viable for biosimilars to be available to all originator biologics at loss of exclusivity. Next. Regulatory certainty and predictability is key to meaningful reform and confidence in science-based regulation. If sponsors are not confident, they're not going to need a comparative efficacy study, they're going to do it. They're not going to take the risk that at the end, they're suddenly asked for comparative efficacy data. And the nature of the development now having concurrent arms, not being the stepwise that was originally anticipated, means unless there is this regulatory certainty and they have confidence in not having to do an unnecessary clinical study, they're going to do it and the situation doesn't change. So it's in our collective interest to create this certainty if we want more biosimilars. Next click. The immediate regulatory changes, the investment decisions are being made today, and they're based on the current costs and the current development times. So a reduction in expectations for comparative efficacy studies today may help restore some of those known pipeline gaps. There is an urgency to actually having the clarity on what's going to be needed for biosimilars in highly regulated and all other markets. Next click. Efficient global development depends on some level of regulatory reliance. 
which includes harmonization and convergence to support fit for purpose standards of safety, quality and efficacy for all biologics. Most of the discussions we've had today are not actually specific to only biosimilars. It applies to all biologics to make our development efficient and affordable and predictable. And this then applies to all biologics for all markets, for all patients. Next click. So we are urging as IGBA, as the global biosimilars industry, and I would argue also the global biologics, industry that we need this consistency in our scientific based regulatory approaches and for biosimilars that means the immediate elimination of expectations for comparative clinical efficacy studies and there, it is urgently needed if we're going to get biosimilars to as many of the originator biologics as possible so if biosimilars are to be feasible and sustainable globally then we do need to be updating our regulations as soon as we possibly can. Next click. So I guess we're on the break. I just want to thank the organizers for this opportunity and to say we as an industry look forward to enabling biosimilars that are high quality, as safe and effective as their reference products to as many biologics as possible. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Gillian, and uh, thank you to all your colleagues and all our presenters uh, so far. Um, now we will provide you all five minutes bio break or time to grab a cup of coffee or whatever stimulant you're needing to, to carry on with the onward discussion. And of course, also uh, encourage our participants to post questions in the Q&A, we have already a long list of questions, but uh, it would be it would be interesting if you still have some interesting points to bring to the table. But I will hope to see you back. Um, that's going to be six minutes to the hour, six minutes to the hour.
So welcome back. I hope you managed to do what was needed in order to be able to continue to listen in here and, and take part in, in our discussion. So we, we received a lot of, of very, very good and interesting questions. I, I believe there's no, there no need to discuss whether we should maintain status quo, because then we could end the, if we agree that status quo is what we like, we could end the discussion here. So I think it's more important that we move on and think about whether we can reduce the requirement for clinical uh, efficacy, comparative efficacy studies, and to what extent we might be able to, uh, to do that. And to kick off that, that discussion, I, I might start out asking, do you believe that we can completely abandon comparative efficacy studies for each and every biosimilar development? Or can you foresee any scenarios where such comparative studies would still be needed in order to establish biosimilarity? Who would like to take that? So I think we can say you have to know why you're doing a clinical study. So it goes back to what is the question you're asking that a clinical study can answer. And it's not clear to me what the residual uncertainty is, to use the, 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 the US term, around which you could design a study, clinical study that would be useful. But I invite the rest of my panel to discuss as well. I think I see Martin's hand up as, as well. Yeah, so my take on this is, um, I mean, we could foresee scenarios where a comparative efficacy study might be needed in the future, um, but that this is then related to situations where, for example, the um, interactions with receptors or the target is not clearly understood. But if I see at the pipeline, which is coming up in the next time, I do not identify such type of molecules. And then with regard to additional safety data, it could relate uh, that, uh, and this could be also part of a risk assessment, whether uh, for a product which has severe safety effects to patients or also uh, there is insufficient understanding of how uh, the functional properties of the molecule relate to those safety events. But also here, um, I would see this is more, it's a more exceptional situation. I mean, one, one example which is mentioned frequently is eprotein, which has uh, the potential of uh, uh, immunogenicity and uh, um, also the um, relations of all the heavy glycosylation to the functions is not 100% understood, I would say. Uh, but again, this is more the exceptional scenario, at least for recombinant biotherapeutics. I, I tend to agree with Martin that the uh, historical and current portfolio of recombinants, I don't think there's a need for residual efficacy, uh, efficacy studies. The term residual uncertainty doesn't sit well with me because I think there's always a danger you're chasing a pink elephant in the jungle. I mean, if fundamentally the analytical comparability and functional assays are supposed to be the bedrock. So if there's residual uncertainty, presumably it's based initially on that review of that data. And there are opportunities, or there should be, for that to be require additional analytical and functional testing or manufacturing change to ensure you're greater aligned. So I think the way the residual uncertainty is, is um, I mean, it should be at the analytical level not through just trying to trump it with an efficacy study. Because if the principle of an efficacy study being insensitive is, is, give, is a given, then, you know, no amount, no, no, just using it as a comfort blanket doesn't help. It just, it just, it just adds on, it just doesn't give you anything at all. So I think your focus should be on analytics, maybe extending the, te the testing, depending on what you believe the residual uncertainty is, or, or ultimately saying, look, you need to modify your process to bring your closer aligned. That's, that's my view.
Hi, good day, everyone. Hi, my name is Giuseppe Randazzo, and I'm, I'm along with the panelists um, is helping getting this uh, set up and, and uh, running today. So thank you to all the panelists. Thanks for having me. I'm currently the VP of Science and Regulatory Affairs at uh, AEM in the U.S. Um, in an effort to keep it very simple and to simplify the answer, I think the paradigm, and we believe the paradigm in thinking needs to shift, and it would become the exception rather than the rule. I think that at a high level is pretty much the simplicity of it. If it would become the exception rather than the rule, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Stephanie. Sorry, I, I was struggling to turn off my mic, turn on my mic. So thank you for those answers. And um, I, I, I think these, these, these give a, a good confidence in, in, in your position. And I also understand your point, Martin, that there might in the future be situations where we, based on science or actually lack of scientific knowledge, still will potentially be needing a head to head comparison. And I heard a strong argument for PKPD studies as maybe the only kind of clinical evidence that might be needed in a, in a, in a, in a biosimilar comparative development program, which I, I can understand and I can see the arguments, but what about products that are not given systemically? So products, let's say for ophthalmology or products where the systemic bioavailability is very low, and where we do not have a complete understanding of the link between PK and PD, would we still need um, would we still need studies there? Yeah, I, I would say on the ophthalmology. So for injections directly in the eye, systemic PK obviously does not make sense. Um, uh, and then I think the decision of which studies are needed should be really tried. okay. What can be which type of questions with regard to efficacy, safety, including immunogenicity, can be addressed by the analytical characterization? And depending on whether there are any gaps to be resolved, um, then some type of clinical studies might be needed. But if it can be completely solved by um, by doing a study which doesn't make sense and systemic PK for these type of injections, yeah, uh, doesn't play a role. So there are a lot of there's a lot of evidence out there in the literature. Good, thank you. And um, again. I think you, Fabrice, spoke a lot to, to the cost and feasibility of doing these kind of studies if they are to be done um, on, on a level where we can really call them high-grade uh, clinical evidence. But if we were to, to consider going forward still having a more or less mandatory clinical efficacy studies comparable, would there be any other impacts on developers and the marketplace for that matter apart from cost and feasibility. Right, I, I think the mathematics are very clear and I would like to quote again this uh, IQVA report. If the default position from the regulators is to request a clinical efficacy study, uh, it means 50% half of the biologic will not get, get a copy. Uh, we have to put things into perspective. A phase three study costs about 50% of the R&D cost of the total biosimilar. So therefore, biosimilar developers do have to prioritize, select on which molecule will be initiated first, developed first. So that means that if we continue with this current paradigm, this threat of 50% of biologic not being copied will materialize and will further expand. The knock-on effect is definitely for the payers, meaning less biosimilar equal more burden on the healthcare system and for the patient. One could, of course, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. One could, of course, ask you, why has it taken us 20 years to realize this? Why has it suddenly become a bigger problem? Has biosimilar development failed? What has suddenly become more expensive? I don't think it's suddenly been a problem. 
but the data on the 50% has become more compelling. And so we just recognize, oops, this is actually going to have consequence. I think there was an assumption out there that just like with generic small molecule drugs, they would always be available. And what we're realizing is that's just not happening. Sponsors are leaving by a similar development and we've got comparatively few sponsors left. And part of it is a very, very high cost. I mean, we're talking essentially about a brand development cost for a generic reimbursement model. And ultimately, that is probably not the best business decision in the world. Maybe another question along the line, if, if we continue requesting comparative studies, maybe not for all, maybe we can alleviate them somewhere. But you also talked about the need for global alliance or global global convergence in, in, in having these requirements. And you are obviously doing global development programs and therefore you need to meet global regulated, global regulatory requirements. Um, and, and maybe global regulators are not as quick as industry to align. And therefore you could end up in a situation where you will have a mismatch in timing between knowing whether a comparative efficacy study will be needed or, or, or whether it wouldn't be needed. So that could have an impact on your development. How, how can we deal with this? Apart from what you can say, well, regulators need to, to unify and, and be well aligned. Elena, you've had your hand up a while. I don't know if you want to take that uh, one or it was a previous Yes, one. I, th I think that was uh, more maybe talking to, to previous points, but, uh, you know, ultimately it, <laughs> it all, all ties together. I mean, just to, to um, again, make the point that I think, of, you know, from the author's perspective of the two papers that we presented, I think the conclusion that we reach is that uh, clinical efficacy studies as a default um, should no longer be uh, required um, if there is sufficient product knowledge, if the mechanism of action is understood, if there is uh, excellent uh, binding and fun functional characterization, and um, any uh, queries or differences can be resolved at that level. I think I've I've made that that point. The authors uh, make that point. They will make it uh, again. Uh, it's in the second paper. So I think we're we're clear uh, clear on that. But having said that. Um, I still think it's not necessarily a discussion of all or nothing. So, I mean, um, if you look at the regulation as it currently stands, it's uh, a requirement for a clinical equivalence trial with uh, very clear demands on the statistics and the patient numbers um, is really what is driving the cost. Uh, I would say the two most important things driving the cost are patient numbers in the clinical efficacy trials and which reference medicinal product uh, you use. Uh, and um, the patient numbers obviously are a function of the primary endpoint uh, and the therapeutic um, margin that was obtained with the originator. And what we see now um, with the new drugs that are in development, they're often in combination therapy regimens. The therapeutic margin is, um, is small. And this leads to extremely high numbers in the order of thousands of patients. And that is um, uh, really a uh, driving cost and not practical. And uh, we had a discussion yes yesterday uh, where the regulators um, responded to feasibility problems was a discussion about uh, orphan drugs and uh, that regulators um, dealt with that and um, took that also into consideration. And I think it's fair to say from an industry's perspective that a request to run a trial that is 1,500 or 2,500 patients large um, uh, is um, questionable. Um, so I think uh, the question is also, do we really always need these equivalence trials? 
um, do we need the margins set the way they're currently set? Um, are there new statistical models that could be considered, for example, Bayesian approaches or other such things? Um, so um, it's not all or nothing. That's one point. Um, looking uh, also at the requirements, must it always be a 12-month trial? I mean, in Europe, we still have this mantra, um, you need a 52-week trial. Do we always have to look at immunogenicity in such great detail, even when we know the originator is a low immunogenic drug, as we do denuzumab, for example, other drugs, um, can be characterized as being low immunogenic, does this make sense? Because we've studied this, regulators have studied this before, and we get a wealth of data here, also from the phase one PK trial. And whenever the originator was high or low immunogenic, uh, this would also reflect in the clinical PK trial, equally in the efficacy trial. So I think there, there are um, ways that we can also examine this. Um, it must not be an all or nothing um, discussion. Thank you. That, and I would just like to point. add to that, if I may, that it goes back to knowing the question you're asking as to what is the uncertainty after you've done the analytics back to Keith's point. We don't ask any of these questions for comparability, or at least not routinely. There's not a presupposition. And so the challenge is, in the context of comparability, what we don't know and what we haven't measured, we presume to be the same. With biosimilarity, what we don't know and haven't measured, we presume to be different, and then we pretend to be applying the same standards. So I think this is the argument for consistency, is know what the question is, and then if you're going to do a clinical study, design it appropriately to answer that question. But we have to move away from the default expectation for a clinical or the nature of the timelines and concurrent development means the status quo continues because no sponsor will dare not to do some form of clinical study. Thank you. Thank you. But but to that point, Elena, you said, well, it's not black and white. Um, it's maybe more tailored, I hear you say. But you also said, well, why do, why do we some circumstances ask for 52-week studies? We already have an issue that many of these studies are actually underpowered. So if we start cutting down on requirements in length and patient numbers, uh, and then still require them as, as, as confirmatory studies, are we not just creating a, some kind of pseudoscience here and, and creating data that is basically not trustworthy? In my view, yes. I think the problem is, is that you, you know, it's comfort, it's comfort blanket that word that's been used. I think we, because we've all, so to speak, grown up with biosimilars demanding these studies, it's now very difficult because when companies develop these products, and I think assessors review them, in part they rely on that clinical data to justify clinical differences. It gives them that little warm fuzzy feeling to say, and by the way, this one percent difference in attribute A doesn't affect PK or efficacy, uh, where it, you know <laughs> you would never have found it if it was a ten percent difference probably. So I think we, you know, you, if you if you from a scientific principle believe they're not sensitive, going reducing the numbers, all you're doing is putting a less thick comfort blanket on you and questioning more the scientific validity. So I think we need to be bold and say that they are not designed as an efficacy study. They're not designed to deal with whatever the residual uncertainty is relating to differences in quality attribute. That's not what they're designed to do, unless you're going to have an enormous study, which probably could never be designed appropriately anyway. So if you agree with that, then it's how do you manage that residual uncertainty? And I go back to my point, it can be managed in much better ways and more accurate ways, calling on the analytics and the manufacturing process. And let, let me continue on that point, Keith, because, and maybe I'm putting words in your mouth here, and let me know if I do so. Basically, you're saying these studies are comforting studies. They make regulators comfortable making a decision of biosimilarity. And one more, I think even more important point, and, and I have a question in the Q&A around that. 
Are these studies not making prescribers and patients comfortable because they give them the sense that these products are equal or the same? Yes. No, I, no, I agree. I think they're a lovely comfort blanket. They're lovely knitted, nice colours. They're warm, they're cosy. You can have them with a glass of wine. They're wonderful. That's it. it but to start with, they were needed because you were proving the paradigm. Right? And you had the bun fight between innovators and biosimilar developers, which we all know about, you know, and there was claims and counterclaims, there was speculation and inferential claims, there was retrospective attribution of, of product quality attributes to products that were never designed that way in the first place. And so I think everyone set we need something to give confidence. And that's what we, it was there. And I think that confidence is now here. So if it now becomes a scientific, rigorous debate around, look, you know, we've we've given you the confidence. We know that this is not required for comparability. We've seen bigger variability, arguably, with some products that have been published in the past. Um, you know, and I think I think that I think we just have to be honest. It's it's it, yes, they were comfort blankets, but you know, we've all grown up now. We we don't need the comfort blanket, in my view. But wouldn't we then be faced with a with a challenge, both industry and regulators, to explain to prescribers and patients equally that this. Blanket is no no longer needed. <laughs> yes, but that's an educational piece, not a scientific regulatory piece. No, I, I agree with you. It's not a scientific issue, but it's a big issue that also could have an impact on uptake of biosimilars and therefore the market access. So if we if we don't continue having trust in these products, and there are still areas in Europe where biosimilars are underutilized or utilized very little, and where they are not trusted. So wouldn't we end up in a situation where we actually are undermining our own arguments and yeah. the market access? If I, may, if, if, if I may chime in, I think it is important that uh, the industry and the regulators are providing uh, guidance and speak as one voice. We've seen it in the context of at the beginning of the biosimilar, where the concept of extrapolation between indication was not super well understood. Uh, after some educational efforts, all the prescribers understood that this comfort blanket, namely conducting a study in their given indication of prescription, is not needed. So we, it, it's all about education. It's all about providing clarity in the guidelines, in my opinion. Yeah, and if I can add, um, I think to make the next step to progress, to make progress here, um, it would be good if we can divide uh, those two questions. On one side, what is needed uh, for regulatory decision making? On one hand, on the other side, what is needed to convince or to, to explain uh, the biosimilar pathway to, to other stakeholders which uh, don't see all the data, for example. And uh, these are two different uh, issues and they need to different separately. Uh, but currently um, regulatory requirements are also um, in place to cover this educational question. And I think engaging also with medical societies, with patients organizations, explaining um, also, what was mentioned yesterday, uh, uh, explaining uh, the level of uh, uh, certainty, uh, which is in the analytical data, can help here. And this is not an effort which is uh, over tomorrow. So this is, a, um, I would say, a continued effort which takes, which needs to take place for the next couple of years. Thank you for those uh, those responses. Um, let's move into some other points. There, there, is a, there, there is a question which may be good to clarify as well around what is maybe we, we all use this and used in your presentation about the uh, the residual uncertainty. What is meant by residual uncertainty? Maybe, maybe can you put more meat on the bones there for the audience? So um, as uh, Keith pointed out, uh, the, the term residual uncertainty is in itself a little bit problematic because the issue is it cannot be quantified. I mean, there is some uncertainty in everything. Also, if you take a, a new innovative, in, innovative drug which has been released, uh, is this uh, making the effect in a certain patient, yes or no? So there is always some kind of residual uncertainty. Um, one solution here could be also to rethink this from the, from another perspective, namely, 
what type of data is needed in order to ensure that a biosimilar candidate is truly similar to a reference product? What are the scientific questions and solve them bit by bit? And um, uh, move, try to move away a little bit from the term residual uncertainty. Mm. May I jump in here? I think this is really what our two presentations are about. I mean, uh, the residual uncertainty uh, uh, arises, for example, if less than 100% of the batches of the biosimilar candidate are not in the reference range of the originator. So this leads to some uncertainty, right? And now we ask the question. That's exactly what these papers are about. And now we ask the question. Well, what does it mean if there is, you know, with regard to all these different critical quality attributes, binding, glycosylation, um, protein, if there is less than 100%, if there is less, a range from 90 to 100%, less than 90%, we really categorized it in different categories. So when it's less than 100%, we looked at this. And if there were Queries, they were resolved by the next layer, sort of of the safety net that you, Martin, quite nicely have laid out. Yeah. So if it was a structural issue, uh, then you would uh, you would uh, um, go to the next uh, to the next level. If there was, let's say, um, a lesser binding to the FCR3 receptor that could translate into lesser ADCC um, uh, and uh, uh, then that would be looked at, and uh, so the, uh, the there were there were uh, several levels: the analytical, the the functional, the binding, and then the cellular level. And so you already have these three cascades where these things can be, where these uncertainties uh, can be resolved. In some instances, if you look at uh, Manot's context, so for example, glycosylation, uh, you know that uh, high Manot's can lead to a higher clearance could have an impact on, on PK. That would be substantial change in manos. I think only 20% or so matter really to, to effectively change the PK. Then here the PK would also be looked at as the next level. But where do you really need the, the clinical trial? And that is sort of the question we're trying to, to answer then in the second paper. Where do you need this clinical trial? Where does the clinical trial provide a gatekeeper function that questions, queries that you ask will actually then will prevent uh, the approval of a drug if the quality data is solid? even if there are some uncertainties, but they are resolved within the quality framework. I think, and I'm just going to put this to the regulators, I think uh, listening to, to uh, René yesterday, we must, uh, uh, how did he say it, we must have a clinical comparability without a clinical trial. And he was now proposing that we need to go back and put statistics around the uh, critical quality attributes. And this is something I really cannot cannot uh, fully understand. I must say that. I mean, we have a group of people uh, as, as regulators, uh, as quality experts that have been evaluating quality dossiers, manufacturing changes, as we've discussed. They've been evaluating this and deciding whether even big changes from pilot scale to commercial, to clinical to commercial scale, these big changes or taking a different cell line, high risk changes, they are deciding this based on quality data without uh, inferential statistics and all of this. And now suddenly we say um, for, for the biosimilar exercise, this should be necessary. Now, I will ask you this question. Does that mean that the ICHQ5E guideline is all wrong and really should be rewritten and that we always need a clinical trial? I, I took I, <laughs> I think the clinical trial really was a very conservative, a very conservative standpoint. We said ICHQ5 e may not be enough for the biosimilar, but now we're 10 years later, we have all this experience. And uh, I think this very conservative approach that we 
actually thinking of this triangle, actually take all the evidence from the quality comparison, the in vitro data that we have, the PK study, and do not need the clinical trial. This is how we've always done it. And we've just added the clinical trial as an on top, as a really that that is the comforting part and to your other point um Stefan you're talking about clinical efficacy trials as if they were um as as, as if this was a, a clear science it is not it is an art and why do I say that is because the different legislations now with the challenges that we have going forward also with these new products have different ways different ways of looking at the statistics looking at the endpoints and uh, actually uh, requesting different numbers of patients as evidence for the clinical studies so it's not one is the the proof of the pudding and the other is a comfort trial. There, there are different ways, different statistics, different ways of looking at this that could still both be valid to reach a conclusion. So um, I really think this is, uh, I think it's a question of yours from before. I think that is also a big concern that the different legislations really um, in their frameworks of what constitutes a valid clinical efficacy study really have different different expectations and that really poses a, a problem for the developers thank you i think also just adding on to Eleanor and martin's point here i mean we, we focus around the ranges of the reference product don't lose sight that the biosimilar company has to develop their own manufacturing process and control strategy the specifications are not, are not the same as the reference product so there's also the, the fourth line of defense if you will this is the manufacturing control there have been situations where if there's some doubt you can in encourage not only change but pull the acceptance criteria in for certain attributes so you can be confident that the, the batches released are not going to necessarily be wider than they should be based on that that's been seen before so there's many tools available to ensure that the the analytics are giving you sufficient confidence that the product creates the same way do you think we will need more analytics if we abandon the comparative clinical trials? I think the key point here is uh, that the analytics must be robust. I mean, uh, it's, it was pointed out very nicely by Marie Christine Bielski yesterday. So a robust uh, package. Uh, this is this is key. It's it's not about making ranges tighter or adding just numbers of of methods. Um, I mean, we, we have a clear tool in place, which is the CQA assessment, which is in place since, uh, I guess, more than 15 years now, where uh, criticality is ranked, uh, and this drives also the development and, and certainly also the biosimilar uh, criteria. Uh, so it, it's really not, the, it, it's more the quality of the data, it's not about the quantity of the data. Yeah, and I think also this is not an attempt to genericize development, to say that the same methods will be, you know, broadly the same approaches are used, but it's product specific, it's user specific. And also going back to this awful term residual uncertainty, there may be occasions where you have to dig deeper, as we've seen previous products, you know, redefine the experiments, use more sensitive blood cells, use more different methodologies to come, you know. So in a sense, if whatever you think is a residual uncertainty, there may be options to to additional more sensitive bioassays or more different blood samples, for example, PBMs or NK cells, whatever you want to use, depending on the situation. So I think it, it's really a, it's still a case by case basis that depending on what, what you're, you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to resolve at the end of it. And Tom, also on what Keith just said, it's, uh, it's also the reason why I'm also critical against the PD biomarkers, because uh, they measure uh, yeah, some um, a, or a combination of uh, um, of the potency of a drug uh, and uh, drug distribution, and we can measure drug distribution very precisely with PK. And for the potency itself, the uh, the the, the biases are much much more sensitive. So adding PD, and uh, even if it's a wonderful super study, it's it's not more meaningful than a quite insensitive bioassay and. Uh, this uh, doesn't help. So we should really focus on what can be measured in a precise manner, what is relevant, and base uh, base uh, the decisions for similarity on those uh, strong facts, so to say. 
may I go back to the to the famous comfort blanket once more? Because I, I, I sense that in our audience, there are still people who have concerns about completely abandoning clinical trials, or at least abandon them in many circumstances. And apparently yesterday, there was a discussion about whether we could, we could instead of having equivalent studies, could have some descriptive studies that could be reassured. How do you see that moving forward? Could, could we still have some kind of clinical studies? And would they be of any, any need or any relevance? Or would it just be a waste of time and money? If I can just jump in, I think we have to be very careful of the ethics of experimenting on human beings without knowing we're going to get new meaningful information. This goes back to Declaration of Helsinki. So just to raise a flag, comfort blanket, I understand the reassurance, but from a regulatory decision-making perspective, as opposed to, as Martin made the distinction, education, we've got to be very, very careful requiring studies that the papers presented by the Elena's already showed were not meaningful. So not to be um, superior about it, but I think let's be very, very careful when we suggest doing clinical studies if we don't know exactly what they're going to do with what level of confidence. Thank you. Thank you. Let me go back to, to another question. We touched a little bit of, of, about the timing. Um, but let's imagine, and, and I think if we agree that clinical comparative studies are the exception and not the rule, if, if that is the way we go forward, you will have to convince regulators for each of your development programs that you have sufficient evidence from your, from your quality comparability exercise, uh, that there is no big residual um, uncertainty that should be alleviated by a clinical study. But that would be rather late in your, in your development program, which could mean that your decision as developer as to whether to start a clinical trial or not will have to be taken rather late because you will have to await the feedback from regulators on your on your comparability exercise, how, how do you see that? Is is that a conundrum, or is that something that we can we can easily solve? So honestly, I don't see this as a big problem, because also if you look at the past. Um, uh, the decision, I mean, it's very clear that robust analytical similarity is a, is a requirement and uh, regulators wanted to see data in order to ensure that, uh, yeah, we have a, a true bias similar in our hands. But in the end, this was always a binary decision. Either the quality was good enough and then we could move on. If the quality was not good enough, then we have to re-optimize our manufacturing process to solve issues. So actually, uh, there is no need uh, to see mature data uh, to make, for example, an advice whether for a certain product, uh, the waiver of a comparative efficacy study is necessary. Because what is more important, and this was also pointed out yesterday by Marie-Christine, that um, the, there must be sufficient understanding of the uh, mode of action. And this is something which can be researched already early on in the development program. And the second thing is whether all relevant quality attributes uh, are known and if methods can be can be done on those. And this is also something a developer can establish at the beginning of a development process. So by using this type of information, and I think René Anu pointed it out, a kind of what is, did he say, uh, evaluation of a concept, or I would put it even stronger, like a, a kind of plan powered by a similar company uh, wants to pursue the development using the list of quality attributes, the way similarity criteria are set, uh, also including a discussion of the mode of action, the mechanism of action, if all relevant bioassays are in place to do this. I think this would be information which could solve this issue um, without waiting for mature data. And this was also pointed out yesterday. If, if you wait for that, nobody uh, will do this because I mean, you're talking about an investment of 100 million around uh, uh, and just uh, to test the waters uh, and to risk a delay of two, three years. Uh, it, it's quite hard for a company to make this decision. 
I mean, the challenge I think is that, you know, let's use a, 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 a there's X number of batches that are, are tested when you go in for the MAAs and the BLAs, you know, I know that can vary, but we won't give a number, but there's a significant number of batches are tested. Now, to have that same data in advance, obviously, is clearly not realistic. But I think if you look, if you be take a broader scope from this, I mean, I, th I would be bold as to say that uh, my view is an assessor is unlikely to grant wave on the back of Honestly, we will do it this way. That's my personal view. I mean, I, I may not, I'm not a regulator no more. I may be wrong. So I think there's got to be a third way. And, and if you think about what's gone on, I mean, what, what's already, what already exists, you have, you have, whether you're in the US, so you have the form of scientific advice meetings or initial advice meetings. You, you have things like post approval manufacturing change protocols, which would be a, adapted perhaps. So basically, you could have a situation where a company comes in with, let's say, I'm going to use the, word, the famous number of three batches, but I'm just using that as a, a stalking horse. They could have three batches at whatever scale, but part of that justification is they, the equivalent of a post-approval, we call it pre-approval, a pre-approval manufacturing comparability protocol saying, look, we're going to scale up from five litres to 100 litres to 10,000. During that time, we're going to test at each side. This is our preliminary ranges. Do you agree these are biosimilar? And it acts as an anchor point for the regulators and the companies as well, because if they're, you know, and then if there's questions at that stage, then the regulator has reasonable input to say, we're not actually happy here. There's a risk if you don't moderate your process that you could come unstuck later on. So I think there's a way of doing it with existing mechanisms and tweaking them. Um, but that's one really for the regulators to decide how much data they want to see in my uh, just to end on on this, because this is a super important question. It was also raised yesterday by Sarah Yim, uh, and she asked uh, the regulators panel on that. Uh, I think it, it could help also here to divide uh, the two problems. One is the problem, uh, can a certain molecule be developed without a comparative efficacy study? And the other problem is, uh, is a biosimilar manufacturer on a good track in uh, making a successful development? And for both, uh, issues, uh, uh, we need a discussion with regulators, we need scientific advice meetings. And so I would say that mature data are needed in order to, to um, have a discussion on whether a biosimilar company is, a, is on a good track for a successful approval. Uh, but the other question, whether a certain molecule can be developed uh, without a comparative efficacy study, this is more a question, as I said, on understanding of the mode of action, uh, understanding of the critical quality attributes. And uh, so, and this this advice could be uh, um, done more earlier in the development process. Maybe just to echo what my colleague said um, and to shed some light on our internal processes. The way we develop biosimilar, we, we start with the small scale and then we move to the commercial scale. Uh, let's not be mistaken, from moving to the small to the large scale, we need to pass the red first taste which means that the quality will already be there. What we will do when we move to large scale, we will mimic, we will reproduce the quality that we have observed at the small scale. So already at that stage, I personally believe we should be in a position to expose the quality of our molecule to the regulators and have, as Martin said, an exchange, a conversation, whether this is the right quality. And I would just like, to chip in with the comparability protocol. If you look back to 1996, it was exactly what has just been discussed. It was a, if I do this and show this data, then will you regulator be okay with that product being the same? It was actually essentially a proposal negotiated with the regulators. And so that same model of instead of having a comparability protocol, you have a biosimilarity protocol actually has a regulatory precedent that builds on Keith's comments that biosimilarity is simply a form of comparability and would actually use an approach that was comfortable for the regulators themselves to use. So I think defining a biosimilarity protocol in terms of if I get this data, you don't have to see it all now, but I will make a commitment to this data and you, FDA or other regulator will say, yep, that's okay, you therefore don't need a comparative efficacy study, would be a perfect way to go because it actually incents better analytical matches rather than relying on people trying to paper over 
possibly some level of difference with a clinical efficacy study, which is de facto pandering in a way that probably is not appropriate for anybody to be doing as a scientific-based regulatory approach. So I think there are some very clear ways forward that we've actually used before. Thank you. Thank you for those answers. Now we've been discussing a lot around efficacy, but the other elephant in the room is, of course, the safety. And uh, one of the questions I received is around um, anti-drug antibodies with repeated dosing. How do we how do we monitor that without having longer term? Does not necessarily have to be fifty two weeks, but at least some long term uh, comparability, and not just a PK study. So I would say the first part of the solution to this is um, also the understanding that comparative immunogenicity needs to be provided by the uh, analytical foundation. I mean, this is a principle which was not invented with the biosimilars. This was invented uh, with uh, the concept of a, setting up a control strategy, where also there was a need in order, I mean, when a new product is developed and uh, then uh, manufacturing process uh, specifications are submitted to the agencies, the key question was, okay, is the control, control strategy sufficient so that every future batch will have uh, a comparable immunogenicity? And this was based by, uh, by, by control of all those structural features which are relevant for the immunogenicity. And this was then expanded with uh, the regulation of manufacturing uh, uh, changes, uh, the same principle applied, so very few changes required additional descriptive uh, immunogenicity information. And the same is true then also for biosimilars. So the contribution of the actual confirmation of immunogenicity in the clinical stage has a very minor contribution overall. And maybe this is something which is not so well seen or uh, um, obvious uh, to the extended medical community because they are used to see those clinical data only. But understanding how regulation of biological products work uh, may be also a key to, to, to make progress here. Um, my mouse is really issues unmuting. Sorry, um, I'm just scrolling here in in the uh, in the questions um, again. Focusing on safety, I, I know we were to discuss comparative effect efficacy, but could there be a, an argument for having clinical studies designed to look at safety? for those proteins where we know that there have been safety issues. Would that make sense? I think Elena's got her hand up. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think, uh, again, I mean, the way we look at safety data and also immunogenicity data is descriptive only, right? So here is a... Um, um, how do you say, a case in point that actually you don't have statistics around it. Uh, and yet I would agree that there are um, situations uh, where it may be useful. And I think uh, it's also one of the questions being asked about the ophthalmology products, um, uh, especially since PK data is so hard to get, um, uh, obviously through the uh, intra-ophthalmologic a route of administration. So here um, it could be that uh, some safety data um, could be actually uh, quite quite valuable. And uh, so I uh, think that is um, that may be a, a way forward. Uh, also uh, to answer another question of yours a bit <laughs> more um, previously, I, I would not think that you should just do a clinical trial to do a clinical trial. It all depends, like Jillian also um, um, uh, 
uh, emphasized on the scientific hypothesis going into such a trial. You should not, um, you cannot actually uh, ethically enroll uh, patients in a trial without a clear purpose. And I think a solution could be um, to have PK trials, multi-dose PK trials powered for PK in patients. So um, efficacy could be a secondary endpoint. Uh, as uh, safety and immunogenicity, but uh, it would be powered for uh, pharmacokinetics, and that would be driving the, the patient number. So maybe have two PK trials, one in healthy volunteers, one, you know, multi-dose in patients with efficacy, safety, immunogenicity as secondary endpoints. Possibility. And the only other thing I would note is we often do, because markets approve differently, um, we do have pharmacovigilance, we do have the collective experience as to what these standards have allowed, which is no changes in, in unusual, unexpected, adverse events. So there is a level of experience here, and it goes to the question of subsequent markets, perhaps not the first market, as to appropriately having pharmacovigilance for all biologics and maybe recognizing how that experience is contributing both individually, collectively to this greater confidence that the biosimilars have been work have worked. They are the, as good as or as bad as their reference. And we actually know that. And so the pharmacovigilant post-approval in one market is actually pre-approval perhaps for another market and can be relied upon too. Thank you. Let me go a little bit uh, beyond the regulatory world um, because we all are talking about uh, developing biosimilars to increase access to biological medicines, uh, affordable biological medicines and so forth. But that means of course that these products should have a market uptake, they should be priced and reimbursed in, in every country. Could you foresee that abandoning clinical studies would mean that some countries would not reimburse your products because there is no clinical comparator study. It doesn't matter. Let's say the regulator I would just say okay, product. Availability is fundamental to any country having the choice, any jurisdiction having the choice. And I think that bigger worry on the pipeline that both Fabrice and I emphasized is if there is no investment in the biosimilars, they're not available to anybody. And I think generally speaking, the confidence in the experience and the intense effort of the highly regulated markets has said these are credible products when they're available. So I think we have a bigger challenge of making currently approved biosimilars more broadly available across jurisdictions in an accessible, affordable manner with addition, without additional regulatory barriers. That's where the regulatory reliance comes in. I think any sponsor would rather their product was available to 8 billion people than to 330 million Americans or what is it, 450 million Europeans. So I think, you know, it doesn't undermine the confidence if we use the experience we've got. And if we say that the regulatory decisions are to be science based, and then there may be additional data that's useful for the purposes of education. Maybe a single uh, last question, which um, may be a little bit more technical question that I even could relate to the current situation with clinical trials. And uh, I might have to read it aloud here saying, regulators are focused on principles that behavior and different cell lines can result in different biological molecules. So if you change the cell line, you might have a different molecule. But what about differences in the patients in terms of different receptors, depending on ethnicity, age, and so forth? Does that have to be taken into consideration in biosimilars development? And you could say it's, a, it's outside today's discussion because if we have to do this, we should have done it already, but uh, maybe I gave the answer myself. The reference product has done it for you.
So if the reference Martin, product you're on is, mute. Mute, Martin. Uh, I was just echoing what Gillian said. So this is really a question for innovative product development uh, to sort this out. Uh, and but this points to a very important uh, principle that uh, regulatory decisions on biosimilars should be done on what is needed to show similarity. And uh, in the past 20 years, there are numerous examples where uh, regular regulatory expectations and requirements were intermingled so that new product development requirements are also applied to biosimilars without uh, uh, really uh, thinking, so is this a true biosimilar question or not? And we still have some requirements existing globally nearly everywhere. So sorting out uh, what is really needed in order to assess uh, what is needed for a biosimilar and what is a requirement which is uh, appropriate for a new product development uh, this is um, this would be good. Thank you. Now there is ten minutes left uh, of our meeting. I think there are still many questions. I also note a lot of very technical, detailed questions related to you know specific questions: how many batches, how many patients, so forth. Uh, I have deliberately skipped those questions because I think they are very specific to, to development programs and, and a little bit outside the discussion about whether we uh, need clinical comparative studies or whether we can reduce those requirements. So sorry to those of you who asked the questions which uh, was not addressed here and also sorry to those of you where we didn't have time to reach the questions. Um, first of all, I will thank the panel of speakers, industry speakers today for their presentations, for the answers to to the questions, um, it has definitely uh, informed us a lot about uh, the thinking in industry and, and the understanding in industry. I think it's important for regulators to move on from here and discuss based on what we heard, based on our own experience and our own learnings. And to that end, I will remind colleagues, regulatory colleagues online today that next week on the 19th, the 20th, and the 21st, again starting at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or 1 p.m. Central European Time, there will be a continuing discussion here for regulators only, and I'm looking forward to see you there and to the discussion. So by that, I will, uh, I will turn back to uh, Brooke, Sarah, and Carol from FDA. Thank you. Um, so I just, I just wanted to really thank, uh, uh, Stefan for doing such a, a great job moderating and also the panelists for, for their very informative talks and, and for, um, highlighting, uh, the, the challenges and your perspective about, um, biosimilar development programs, um, and trying to streamline them. Um, I think, uh, today. It, it kind of surprises me. There were some questions in the in the chat that um, suggested people thought we were all harmonized already. Um, I, I think what we what we really have learned over the last two days has been um, how how many different perspectives there can be to the same set of scientific data. But um, but we're committed to try and and be very scientific in terms of our uh, our rationale and uh, and also to committed to trying to advance streamlining so that we can um, get to the main point, which is to increase access to these important therapies for patients. So um, I appreciate everybody's participation and work on this. Um, Carol, Brooke, and Sarah Eikenberry behind the, the scenes working on all these questions. It was it was uh, almost a little bit. Uh, chaotic at first, but um, but I think we, uh, we we got it down a little bit uh, smoother today. But uh, but thanks for everyone for participating and um, and we'll uh, we'll try to post uh, everything on our website, um, our, our public website soon. And uh, of course, we'll we'll be meeting as regulators next week. So um, Appreciate it, everybody's participation. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you.